story time Saturday today is Saturday and it's story time I may be 20 minutes late but that is because uh, none of your business so there <laughs> just kidding I was eating lunch I was hungry hungry it I act it, I had stuff to do in the morning, and then and then it took me a minute to make my lunch because I made my lunch like a responsible human being that, that I am. As a lemon, I'm a very responsible human being. All right, so I thought today would be fun if we read some Sherlock Humes because it's in the public domain and I have it available to me. <laughs> that and I am a big fan of mysteries. They're my jam, man. Murder. It's real cool. I mean, you might be noticing a theme here. What with the ace attorney earlier this week, too. I I like murder. What can I say? It's my favorite pastime in Minecraft. I'm just kidding. My favorite t pastime in Minecraft is, is uh, cave squares. Which is, you know, possibly concerning. <gasps> There's a World of Warcraft card in here. <laughs> Whoever was reading this last, I think, used this crab walk card <laughs> as a bookmark and forgot. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's very good. It's not even a Magic the Gathering card. It's a World of Warcraft miniatures game card. That's ridiculous. Gotta love that. Anyway. <laughs> that nerd nonsense aside. So, this is the complete Sherlock Holmes. We're in volume one right now, because I thought we might as well start at the beginning. A very good place to start. And we can read the first one. We can read the first... We can read the first mystery. A study in Scarlet. Might as well. I mean, start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Because technically, Sherlock Holmes is not like one big overarching story. It was just a bunch of short stories, a bunch of mysteries. And short stories, it, it varies. They vary in length. But just like this big... Sorry. <laughs> I don't know, my brain is all over the place today. But, um, yeah, so technically we could read any of them in any order, but it feels only proper to read the first story. First wise. First while. All right. Let's see here. I gotta go past the the notes for the people who compiled the book. Mm. All right. So the framing device for Sherlock Holmes, if you do, if you don't know, if you haven't actually read any of it before, is that it's all from the notes of Doctor Watson. That he's writing down all of the mystery adventures that they go on. Which I think is pretty neat. You know, it's just sort of his diary. Having a grand old time. Writing about his adventures with his friend. Friend ventures. And that... And I tell you this. Because part... Part one here. Of A Study in Scarlet. Is subheaded. Being a reprint from the reminiscences of John H. Watson, M.D. Late of the Army Medical Department. So there's our context there telling us that this story is from the reminiscences or his journals of Dr. Watson, who used to be an army doctor. Look at all that info and just one subheading. It's because it's in old fancy words. But don't worry, I'm an expert translator in old fancy words. Chapter 1, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. 
In the year 1878, I took my degree of Doctor of Medicine of the University of London and proceeded to Netley to go through the course prescribed for surgeons in the army. Having completed my studies there, I was duly attached to the 5th Northumberland Fusiliers as assistant surgeon. The regiment was stationed in India at the time, and before I could join it, the Second Afghan War had broken out. On landing at Bombay, I learned that my corps had advanced through the passes and was already deep in the enemy's country. I followed, however, with many other officers who were in the same situation as myself, and succeeded in reaching Kandahar in safety, where I found my regiment and at once entered upon my new duties. Hey, hey, beauty. I have to imagine that it would be real scary to be a military doctor, because I think it's scary to be a doctor in the first place, because you got literally people's ding-dang lives in their hands. And, you know, that's just sort of scary. But, uh... Then you're in the army, it's like... You gotta do that while also getting shot at with ding dang guns. And that's terrifying. <laughs> the campaign brought honor honors and promotion to many, but for me it had nothing but misfortune and disaster. Oh well, I should have read on ahead. I guess he agrees with me. Oh boy. I was removed from my brigade and, and attached to the Berkshires, with whom I served at the fatal battle of my wand. There I was struck in the shoulder by a Giselle bullet, a long, heavy Afghan musket, which shattered the bone and grazed the subclavian artery. I should have fallen into the hands of the murderous Ghazis had it not been for the devotion and courage shown by Murray, my orderly, who threw me across a pack horse and succeeded in bringing me safely to the British lines. Uh, this is old-timey words, so there... It's, like, phrases like Ghazis, as in, like, it's a shortening for, you know, a whole kind of people. So there are going to be words like that. And I'm, if they're real, if they're real bad, then I'm not going to say them, naturally, because I would feel bad. But there are some where it's sort of in, like, a gray area. And, and I'm going to sort of breeze past them because... This is historical words, and I, w I don't want to, you know, replace them because I don't know what would be, one, a proper thing to replace them with, and two, if I really have that authority. Also, because sanitizing history doesn't save us from it. We just, we should just critique what is there and understand that it's not acceptable now, rather than trying to sanitize it to make ourselves feel better about things that, you know, might just be kind of crummy. Like how racist H.P. Lovecraft was. Even for the time, he was hella racist. Anyway. Worn with pain and weak from the prolonged hardships which I had undergone, I was removed with a great train of wounded sufferers to the base hospital at Peshawar. Here I rallied and had already improved so far as to be able to walk without the wards and even to bask a little upon the veranda when I was struck down by enteric fever. That curse of our Indian possessions. Yeah, I mean, they're only Indian. You're talking about, you know, the continent, subcontinent of India <laughs> there that you're possessing, British man. For months, my life was despaired of, and when at last I came to myself and became convalescent, I was so weak and emaciated that a medical board determined that not a day should be lost in sending me back to England. I was dispatched accordingly in the troop ship Orantes, and landed a month later on Portsmouth Jetty, with my health irretrievably ruined, but with permission from a paternal government to spend the next nine months in attempting to improve it. So Dr. Watson got shot, while he was in a different campaign in India. And so he went to the hospital and he was recovering fine, but then he got uh, a really bad disease and it totally wrecked his shit. And he got better from the disease and then was sent back to England to get even more better. I had neither kith nor kin in England and was therefore as free as air or as free as an income of 11 shillings and sixpence a day will permit a man to be. Under such circumstances, I naturally gravitated to London, that great cesspool into which all the lodgers and idlers of the empire are irresistibly drained. 
There I stayed for some time at a private hotel in the Strand, leading a comfortless, meaningless existence, and spending such money as I had considerably more freely than I ought. So alarming did the state of my finances become that I soon realized that I must either leave the metropolis and rusticate somewhere in the country, or that I must make a complete alteration in my style of living. Choosing the latter alternative, I began by making up my mind to leave the hotel and take up my quarters in some less pretentious and less expensive domicile. <laughs> uh, he's coming to his senses a little bit, but he is still very sad. On the very day that I had come to this conclusion, I was standing at the Criterion Bar when someone tapped me on the shoulder and, turning around, I recognized young, young Stanford, who had been a dresser under me at Bart's. He was a medical assistant whose duties included bandaging or dressing wounds. And Bart's is short for St. Bartholomew's Hospital in central London. Well, as we're going along here, I'm reading, there are footnotes. Very helpful. For my... Stupid, dumb, idiot brain. The sight of a friendly face in the great wilderness of London is a pleasant thing indeed to a lonely man. In old days, Stamford had never been a particular crony of mine, but now I hailed him with enthusiasm, and he, in his turn, appeared to be delighted to see me. In the exuberance of my joy, I asked him to lunch with me at the Holborn, and we started off together in a hansom. Ah, yay. Whatever have you been doing with yourself, Watson? He asked in undisguised wonder as we rattled through the, Lon the crowded London streets. You're thin as a lathe and as brown as a nut. <laughs> All right, rude. I gave him a short sketch of my adventures and had hardly concluded by the time that we reached our destination. Poor devil, he said commiseratingly after he had listened to my misfortunes. What are you up to now? Looking for lodgings, I answered trying to solve the problem as to whether it is possible to get comfortable rooms at a reasonable price. That's a strange thing, remarked my companion. You are the second man today that has, asked, has used that expression to me. And who was the first? I asked. A fellow who was working at the chemical laboratory at the hospital. He was bemoaning himself this morning because he could not get someone to go halves with him in some nice rooms which he had found, and which were too much for his purse. "'By Jove!' I cried. "'If he really wants someone to share the rooms and the expense, "'I am the very man for him. "'I should prefer having a partner to being alone.' "'Young Stanford looked rather strangely at me over his wine glass. "'You don't know Sherlock Holmes yet,' he said. "'Perhaps you would not care for him as a constant companion.' "'Why, what is there against him?' "'Oh, I didn't say there was anything against him. "'He's a little queer in his ideas, "'an enthusiast in some branches of science.' As far as I know, he's a decent fellow enough. A medical student, I suppose, said I. No, I have no idea what he intends to go in for. I believe he's well up in anatomy, and he's a first-class chemist. But, as far as I know, he has never taken out any systematic medical classes. His studies are very desultory and eccentric, but he has amassed a lot of out-of-the-way knowledge which would astonish his professors. Did you never ask him what he was going in for? I asked. No, he is not a man that it is easy to draw out, though he can be communicative, communicative enough when the fancy seizes him. I should like to meet him, I said. If I am to, to lodge with anyone, I should prefer a man of studious and quiet habits. I am not strong enough yet to stand much noise or excitement. I had enough of both in Afghanistan to last me for the remainder of my natural existence. How could I meet this friend of yours? He is sure to be at the laboratory returned my companion. He either avoids the place for weeks, or else he works there from morning till night. If you like, we will drive round together after luncheon. Certainly, I answered, and the conversation drifted away into other channels. As we made our way to the hospital after leaving the Holborn, Stanford gave me a few more particulars about the gentleman whom I proposed to take as a fellow lodger. You mustn't blame me if you don't get on with him, he said. I know nothing more of him than I have learned from meeting him occasionally in the lab laboratory. He proposed this arrangement, so you must not hold me responsible. <laughs> really hedging his bets here. <laughs> this guy is a weirdo. If you don't like him, it's not my fault. If we don't get on, it will be easy to part company, I answered. 
It seems to me, Stamford, I added, looking hard at my companion, that you have some reason for watching, washing your hands of the matter. Is this fellow's temper so formidable, or what is it? Don't be mealy-mouthed about it. It is not easy to express the inexpressible, he answered with a laugh. Holmes, Holmes is a little too scientific for my tastes. It approaches to cold-bloodedness. I could imagine his giving a friend a little pinch of the latest vegetable alkaloid, not out of malevolence, you understand, but simply out of a spirit of inquiry in order to have an accurate idea of the effects. To do him justice, I think that he would take it himself with the same readiness. He appears to have a passion for definite and exact knowledge. Very right, too. Yes, but it may be pushed to excess. When it comes to beating the subjects in the dissecting rooms with a stick, it is certainly taking a rather bizarre shape. Beating the subjects? Yes, to verify how far bruises may be produced after death. I saw matters with my own eyes. And yet you say he is not a medical student. No, heaven knows what the objects of his studies are. But here we are, and you must form your own impressions about him. As he spoke, we turned down a narrow lane and passed through a small side door, which opened into a wing of the great hospital. It was familiar ground to me, and I needed no guiding as we ascended the bleak stone staircase and made our way down the long corridor with its vista of whitewashed wall and dun-colored doors. Near the farther end of a low-arched passage, branched away from it, and led to the chemical laboratory. This was a lofty chamber, lined and littered with countless bottles. Broad, low tables were scattered about, which brith bristled with retorts, test tubes, and little Bunsen lamps, with their blue flickering flames. There was only one student in the room, who was bending over a distant table, absorbed in his work. At the sound of our steps, he glanced round and sprang to his feet with a cry of pleasure. I've found it! I've found it! He shouted to my companion, running towards us with a test tube in his hand. I have found a reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and by nothing else. Had he discovered a gold mine, greater delight could not have shown upon his features. Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said Stamford, introducing us. How are you? he said cordially, gripping my hand with a strength for which I should hardly have given him credit. You've been in, in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? I asked him in astonishment. Never mind, said he, chuckling to himself. The question now is about hemoglobin. No doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine. It is interesting chemically, no doubt, I answered, but practically. Why, man, it is the most practical medical, medical legal discovery for years. Don't you see that it gives us an infallible test for blood stains? Come out here now. He seized me by the coat sleeve and his eagerness and drew me over to the table at which he had been working. Let's have some fresh blood, he said, digging a long bodkin into his finger and drawing off the, the resulting drop of blood in a, into a chemical pipette. Now, I add this small quantity of blood to a liter of water. You perceive that the resulting mixture has the appearance of pure water. The proportion of blood cannot be more than one in a million. I have no doubt, however, that we shall be able to obtain the characteristic reaction. As he spoke, he threw into the vessel a few white crystals, and then added some drops of a transparent fluid. In an instant, the contents assumed a dull mahogany color, and a brownish dust was precipitated to the bottom of the glass jar. Ha! 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 He cried, clapping his hands and looking as delighted as a child with a new toy. What do you think of that? It seems to be a very delicate test, I remarked. Beautiful, beautiful, the old guachy. Guachum test? Chemical names, wow. Was very clumsy and uncertain. So is the microscopic examination for blood corpuscules. Corpuscules. Eh, I don't know, science words. The latter is valueless if the stains are a few hours old. Now, this appears to act as well, whether the blood is old or new. Had this test been invented... There are hundreds of men now walking the earth who long ago, who would long ago have paid the penalty of their crimes. Indeed, I murmured. Criminal cases are continually hanging upon that one point. A man is suspected of a crime months, perhaps, after it has been committed. His linen or clothes are examined and brownish stains discovered upon them. Are they blood stains or mud stains or rust stains or fruit stains or what are they? That is a question which has puzzled many an expert. And why? Because there was no reliable test. Now we have the Sherlock Holmes's test and there will no longer be any difficulty. His eyes fairly glittered as he spoke, and he put his hand over his heart and bowed, as if to some applauding crowd conjured up by his imagination. "'You are to be congratulated,' I remarked, considerably surprised at his enthusiasm. 
There was a case of Von Bishop at Frankfurt last year. He would certainly have been hung had this test been in existence. Then there was Mason of Bradford and the notorious Muller and Lefauve of Montpellier and Samson of New Orleans. I could name a score of cases in which it would have been decisive. You seem to be a walking calendar of crime, said Stamford with a laugh. You might start a paper on those lines. Call it the police news of the past. Very interesting reading it might be made too, remarked Sherlock Holmes, sticking a small piece of plaster over the prick on his finger. I have to be careful, he continued, turning to me with a smile, for I dabble with poisons a good deal. He held out his hand as he spoke, and I noticed that it was all mottled over with similar pieces of plaster and discolored with strong acids. Oh, dear. We came here on business, said Stamford, sitting down with, on a high three-legged stool and pushing another one in my direction with his foot. My friend here wants to take diggings, and as you were complaining that you could get no one to go halves with you, I thought that I'd better bring you together. Sherlock Holmes seemed delighted at the idea of sharing his rooms with me. I have my eye on a suite in Baker Street, he said, which should suit us down to the ground. You don't mind the smell of strong tobacco, I hope. I hope. Always smoke ships myself, I answered. That's good enough. I generally have chemicals about and occasionally do experiments. Would that annoy you? By no means. Let me see. What are my other shortcomings? I get in the dumps at times and don't open my mouth for days on end. You must not think I am sulky when I do that. Just let me alone and I'll soon be right. What have you to confess now? It's just as well for two fellows to know the worst of one another before they begin to live together. I laughed at this cross-examination. I keep a bull pup, I said, and I object to Rose because my nerves are shaken, and I get up at all sorts of ungodly hours, and I am extremely lazy. I have another set of vices when I'm well, but those are the principal ones at present. Do you include violin playing in your category of Rose? he asked anxiously. It depends on the player. I answered. A well-played violin is a treat for the gods, a badly played one. Oh, that's all right, he cried with a merry laugh. I think we may consider this thing as settled. That is, if the rooms are agreeable to you. When shall we see them? Call for me here at noon tomorrow, and we'll go together and settle everything, he answered. All right, noon exactly, said I, shaking his hand. We le left him working among his chemicals, and we walked together towards my hotel. By the way, I asked suddenly, stopping and turning upon Stamford, how the deuce did he know I had come from Afghanistan? My companion smiled an enigmatical smile. That's just his peculiarity, he said. A good many people have wanted to know how he finds things out. Oh, a mystery, is it? I cried, rubbing my hands. This is very piquant. I am much obliged for you to, to you for bringing us together. The proper study of mankind is man, you know. You must study him, then, Stamford said, as he bade me goodbye. You'll find him a naughty problem, though. I'll wager he learns more about you than you about him. Goodbye. Goodbye, I answered, and strolled on to my hotel, considerably interested in my new acquaintance. Woo! So exciting. Chapter 2. The Science of Deduction. We met next day as we had arranged, and inspected the rooms at number 221B Baker Street, of which he had spoken at our meeting. It consisted of a, com a couple of comfortable bedrooms, and a single large airy sitting room, cheerfully furnished and illuminated by two broad windows. So desirable in every way were the apartments, and so moderate did the term seem when divided between us, that the bargain was concluded upon the spot, and we at once entered in into possession. Wow! Imagine if it was that easy now. <laughs> Just walk in, be like, hey, me and my friend are splitting halvesies. This place is cheap and real nice. Two bedrooms? Wow. That very evening, I moved my things round from the hotel, and on the following morning, Sherlock Holmes followed me with several boxes and portmanteaus. For a day or two, we were busily employed in unpacking and laying out our property to the best advantage. That done, we gradually began to settle down and to accommodate ourselves to our new surroundings. Holmes was certainly not a difficult man to live with. He was quiet in his ways, and his habits were regular. It was rare for him to be up after ten at night, and he had invariably breakfasted and gone out before I rose in the morning. 
Sometimes he spent his day at the chemical laboratory, sometimes in the dissecting rooms, and occasionally in long walks, which appeared to take him into the lowest portions of the city. Hey, better. We're reading Sherlock Holmes. Mystery. So exciting. Nothing could exceed his energy when the working fit was upon him, but now and again, a reaction would seize him, and for days on end, he would lie upon the sofa in the sitting room, hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night. On these occasions, I have noticed such a dreamy, vacant expression in his eyes that I might have suspected him of being addicted to the use of some narcotic, had not the temperance and cleanliness of his whole life forbidden such a notion. As the weeks went by, my interest in him and my curiosity as to his aims in life gradually deepened and increased. His very person and appearance were such as to strike the attention of the most casual observer. In height, he was rather over six feet, and so excessively lean that he seemed to be considerably taller. My boy, slim, thick, skinny legend. Got be quaking. His eyes were sharp and piercing, save during those intervals of torture to torpor. Torture would be uh, concerning in, in, diff in a different way. To which I have alluded, and his thin, hawk-like nose gave his whole expression an air of alertness and decision. His chin, too, had the prominence and squareness which mark the man of determination. His hands were invariably blotted with ink and stained with chemicals, yet he was possessed of extraordinary delicacy of touch, as I frequently had occasion to observe when I watched him manipulating his fragile philosophical instruments. I got a fragile, fragile philosophical instrument right here. It's my heart. Be delicate. Ah. The reader may set me down as a hopeless busybody when I confess how much this man stimulated my curiosity, and how much I endeavored to break through the reticence which he showed on all the concern himself. Before pronouncing judgment, however, be it remembered how obje objectless my life was my life, and how little there was to engage my attention. I was bored as hell. No thoughts. Head empty. <laughs> My health forbade me from venturing out unless the, ve the weather was exceptionally genial, and I had no friends who would call upon me and break the monotony of my daily existence. Under these circumstances, I eagerly hailed the little mystery which hung around my companion, and spent much of my time in endeavoring to unravel it. He was not studying medicine. He had himself, in reply to a question, confirmed Stanford's opinion upon that point— Neither did he appear to have pursued any course of reading which might fit him for a degree in science or any other recognized portal which would give him an entrance into the learned world. Yet his zeal for certain studies was remarkable. And within eccentric limits, his knowledge was so extraordinarily ample and minute that his observations have fairly astounded me. Surely no man would work so hard or attain such precise information unless he had some definite end in view. Yeah, he's a bit of a Chad. Skinny Chad. Tall Chad. And also, smart Chad. The whole package. All three, all three characteristics you need. Desultory readers are seldom remarkable for the exactness of their learning. No man burdens his mind with small matters unless he has some very good reason for doing so. I don't know. I burdened myself with much knowledge for no reason. But uh, I suppose that I would be the desultory reader <laughs> there, <laughs> which I believe means more reading in general with a lack of developed precise knowledge. <laughs> big brain, big Brian. His ignorance was as remarkable as his knowledge. Of com contemporary literature, philosophy, and politics, he appeared to know next to nothing. Upon my quoting Thomas Carlyle, he inquired in the naivest way, whoever he might be, and what he had done. He 
My surprise reached a climax, however, when I found, incidentally, that he was ignorant of the Copernican theory and the composition of the solar system. That any civilized human being in this 19th century should not be aware that the Earth traveled around the sun appeared to me to be such an extraordinary fact that I could hardly realize it. <laughs> he genuinely didn't know <laughs> that the Earth goes around the sun. Oh my god. Maybe Big Brain- maybe we spoke too soon about Big Brain. <laughs> You appear to be astonished, he said, smiling at my expression of surprise. Now that I do know it, I shall do my best to forget it. To forget it? You see, he explained, I consider that a man's brain originally is like a little empty attic, and you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose. A fool takes in all the lumber of every sort that he comes across, so that the knowledge which might be useful to him gets crowded out, or at best is jumbled up with a lot of other things, so that he has a difficulty in laying his hands upon it. Now, the skillful workman is very careful indeed as to what he takes into his brain attic. He will have nothing but the tools, which may help him in doing his work, but of these he has a large assortment, and all in all, the, and all in the most perfect order. It is a mistake to think that that little room has elastic walls and can distend to any extent. Depend upon it, there comes a time for every addition of knowledge you forget something that you knew before. It is of the highest importance, therefore, not to have useless facts elbowing out the useful ones. But the solar system, I protested. Sip, sip, drink water. What the deuce is it to me? He interrupted impatiently. You say that we go round the sun. If we went round the moon, it would not make a pennyworth of difference to me or to my work. I was on the point of asking him what that work might be, but something in his manner showed me that the question would be an unwelcome one. <laughs> I pondered over our short conversation, however, and endeavored to draw my deductions from it. He said that he would acquire no knowledge which did not bear upon his object. Therefore, all the knowledge which he possessed was such, a, was such as would be useful to him. I enumerated in my own mind all the various points upon which he had shown me that he was exceptionally well informed. I even took a pencil and jotted them down. I could not help smiling at the document when I had completed it. It ran in this way. Sherlock Holmes. His limits? Number one, knowledge of literature. Nil. Two, philosophy. Nil. Three, astronomy. Nil. Four, politics. Feeble. Thanks. I enjoy, I, I enjoy me some accents. Five, botany. Variable. Well up in belladonna, opium, and poisons generally. Knows nothing of practical gardening. Six. Knowledge of geology. Practical but limited. Tells at a glance different soils from each other. After walks, has shown me splashes upon his trousers and told me by their color and consistence in one part of London he had received them. Knowledge of chemistry. Profound. Eight. Anatomy. Accurate but unsystematic. Nine. Sensational literature. Immense. He appears to know every detail of every horror per perpetuated in the century. Ten, plays the violin well. Eleven, is an expert single stick player, one-handed fencing stick fitted with a handguard, boxer and swordsman. Oh, wow. Truly a chad. Twelve, has a good practical knowledge of British law. When I got so far in my list, I threw it into the fire in despair. If I can only find what the fellow is driving at by reconciling all these accomplishments and discovering a calling which needs them all, I said to myself, I may as well give up the attempt at once. I see that I have alluded above to his powers upon the violin. These were very remarkable, but as eccentric as all his other accomplishments. He could play pieces and difficult pieces, I knew well, because at my request he has played me some of Mendelssohn's Leder. Leder on the Song Without Words, by Felix Mendelssohn, and other favorites. When led to, left to himself, however, he would seldom produce any music or attempt any recognized air. Leaning back in his armchair of an evening, he would close his eyes and scrape carelessly at the fiddle which was thrown across his knee. Sometimes the codes, chords were sonorous and melancholy. Occasionally they were fantastic and cheerful. 
Clearly they reflected the thoughts which possessed him, but whether the music aided those thoughts, or whether the playing was simply the result of a whim or fancy, was more than I could determine. I might have rebelled against these exasperating solos had it not been that he usually terminated them by playing in quick succession a whole series of my favorite airs as a slight compensation for the trial upon my patience. <laughs> During the first week or so, we had no callers, and I had begun to think that my companion was as friendless a man as I was myself. Presently, however, I found that he had many acquaintances, and those in the most different classes of society. There was one little, sallow, rat-faced, dark-eyed fellow who was introduced to me as Mr. Lestrade, and who came three or four times in a single week. One morning a young girl called, fashionably dressed, and stayed for half an hour or more. The same afternoon brought a gray-headed, seedy visitor, looking like a Wow. Looking like a peddler, who appeared to me to be much excited, and who was closely followed by a slipshod elderly woman. On another occasion, an old white-haired gentleman had an interview with my companion, and on another, a railway porter in his velveteen uniform. When any of these nondescript individuals put in an appearance, Sherlock Holmes used to beg for the use of the setting room, and I would retire to my bedroom. He always apologized to me for putting me to this inconvenience. I have to use this room as a place of business, he said, and these people are my clients. Ooh, that was rough. <laughs> Sorry, I keep, I keep wiggling. I can't seem to... Sit comfortably here. All right. Again, I had an opportunity of asking him a point blank question, and again, my delicacy prevented me from forcing another man to confide in me. I imagined at, at the time that he had some strong reason for not alluding to it, but he soon, soon dispelled the idea by coming round to the subject of his own accord. It rose upon the 4th of March, as I have good reason to remember, that I rose somewhat earlier than usual and found that Sherlock Holmes had not yet finished his breakfast. The landlady had become so accustomed to my late habits that my place had not been laid nor my coffee prepared. With the unreasonable petulance of mankind, I rang the bell and gave a curt intimation that I was ready. Then I picked up a magazine from the table and attempted to while away the time with it, while my companion munched silently at his toast. One of the articles had a pencil mark at the heading, and I naturally began to run my eye through it. Its somewhat ambitious title was The Book of Life, and it attempted to show how much an observant man might learn by an accurate and systematic examination of all that came in his way. It struck me as being a remarkable mixture of shrewdness and of absurdity. The reasoning was close and intense, but the deductions appeared to me to be far-fetched and exaggerated. The writer claimed... By a momentary expression, a twitch of, of a muscle, or a glance of an eye, to fathom, fathom a man's inmost thoughts. Deceit, according to him, was an impossibility in the case of one trained to observation and analysis. His conclusions were as infallible as so many propositions of Euclid. So startling would his results appear to the uninitiated, that until they learned the process by which he had arrived at them, they might well consider him as a necromancer. From a drop of water, said the writer, a logician could infer the possibility of an Atlantic or a Niagara without having seen or heard of one or the other. So all life is a great chain, and the nature of which is known whenever we are shown a single link of it. Like all other arts, the science of deduction and analysis is one which can only be acquired by long and patient study, nor is life long enough to allow any mortal to attain the highest possible perfection in it. Before turning to those moral and mental aspects of the matter, which presents the greatest difficulties, let the inquirer begin by mastering more elementary problems. Let him, on meeting a fellow mortal, learn at a glance to distinguish the history of the man, and the trade or profession to which he belongs. Puerile as such an exercise might, may seem, it sharpens the faculties of observation, and teaches one where to look and what to look for. By man's fingernails, by his coat sleeve, by, by his boots, by his trouser knees, by the callosities of his forefinger and thumb, by his expression, by his shirt cuffs, by each of those these things a man's calling is plainly revealed. That all united should fail to enlighten the competent inquirer, in any case, is almost inconceivable. What ineffable, ineffable twaddle! 
I cried, slapping the magazine down on the table. I never read such rubbish in my life. What is it? Asked Sherlock Holmes. Why, this article, I said, pointing at it with my egg spoon as I sat down to my breakfast. I see that you have read it since you have marked it. I don't deny that it is smartly written. It irritates me, though. It is evidently the theory of some theory of some armchair lounger who evolves all these neat little paradoxes in the seclusion of his own study. It is not practical. I should like to see him clap down in a third-class carriage on the underground and ask to, to give the trades of all his fellow travelers. I would lay a thousand to one against him. You would lose your money, Holmes remarked calmly. As for the article, I wrote it myself. You? Yes, I have a turn both for observation and for deduction. The theories which I have expressed there, and which appear to you to be so chim chimerical, are really extremely practical. So practical that I depend upon them for my bread and cheese. And how? I asked involuntarily. Well, I have a trade of my own. I suppose I am the only one in the world. I'm a consulting detective, if you can understand what that is. Here in London, we have lots of government detectives and lots of private ones. When these fellows are at fault, they come to me, and I manage to put them on the right scent. They all lay the evidence before me, and I am generally able, by the help of my knowledge of the history of crime, to set them straight. There is a strong family resemblance about misdeeds, and if you have all the details of a thousand at your finger ends, it is all that, that you can't unravel the thousand and first. Lestrade is a well-known detective. He got himself into a fog recently of a forgery case, and that was what brought him here. And these other people? They're mostly sent on by private inquiry agencies. They're all people who are in trouble about something and want a little enlightening. I listen to their story, they listen to my comments, and then I pocket my fee. But do you mean to say, I said, that without leaving your room you can unravel some knot which other men can make nothing of, although they have seen every detail for themselves? Quite so. I have a kind of intuition that way. Now and again a case turns up which is a little more complex. Then I have to bustle about and see things with my own eyes. You see, I have a lot of special knowledge which I apply to the problem, and which facilitates matters wonderfully. Those rules of deduction laid down in that article which aroused your scorn are invaluable to me in practical work. Observation with me is second nature. You appeared to be surprised when I told you on our first meeting that you had come from Afghanistan. You were told, no doubt. Nothing of the sort. I knew you came from Afghanistan. From long habit, the train of thought ran so swiftly through my mind that I arrived at that conclusion without being conscious of an intermediate steps. There were such steps, however. The train of reasoning ran. Here is a gentleman of a medical type, but with the air of a military man. Clearly an army doctor, then. He has just come from the tropics, for his face is dark, and that is not the natural tint of his skin, for his wrists are fair. He has undergone hardship and sickness, as his haggard face says clearly. His left arm has been injured. He holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have seen, seen much hardship and gotten his arm wounded, clearly in Afghanistan? The whole train of thought did not occupy a second. I then remarked that you came from Afghanistan and you were astonished. It's simple enough as you explain it, I said, smiling. You remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories. Sherlock Holmes rose and lit his pipe. No doubt you think that you are complimenting me and comparing me to Dupin, he observed. Now, in my opinion, Dupin was a very inferior fellow. That trick of his of breaking in on his friend's thoughts with an apropos remark of a quarter of an hour's silence is really very showy and superficial. He had some analytical genius, no doubt, but he was by no means such a phenomenon as Poe appeared to imagine. Have you read Gaboriau's works? I asked. Does Lecoq co come up to your idea of a detective? Sherlock Holmes sniffed sardonically. Lecoq was a miserable bungler, he said in an angry voice. He had only one thing in recommend him, and that was his to recommend him, and that was his energy. That book made me positively ill. The question was how to identify an unknown prisoner. I could have done it in twenty four hours. Lecoq took six months or so. It might be made a textbook for detectives to teach them what to avoid. I felt rather indignant at having two characters whom I had admired treated in this cavalier style. I walked over to the window and stood looking out into the busy street. This fellow may be very clever, I said to myself, but he is certainly very conceited.
There are no crimes and no criminals in these days, he said querulously. What is the use of having brains in our profession? I know well that I have it in me to make my name famous. No man lives or has ever lived who has brought the same amount of study and of natural talent to the defect action of crime, which I have done. And what is the result? There is no crime to detect, or at most some bungling villainy with a motive so transparent that even a Scotland Yard official can see through it. I was still annoyed at his bumptious style of conversation. thought it best to change the topic. I wonder what that fellow is looking for, I asked, pointing to a stalwart, plainly dressed individual who was walking slowly down the other side of the street, looking anxiously at the numbers. He had a large blue envelope in his hand, and was evidently the bearer of a message. You mean the retired sergeant of marines, said Sherlock Holmes. Brag and bounce, I thought to myself. He knows that I cannot verify his guess. The thought had hardly passed through my mind when the man whom we were watching caught sight of the number upon our door and ran rapidly across the roadway. We heard a loud knock, a deep voice below, and heavy steps ascending the stair. For Mr. Sherlock Holmes, he said, stepping into the room and handing my friend the letter. It was an opportunity of taking the conceit out of him. He little thought of this when he made that random shot. May I ask, my lad, I said in the blandest voice, what your trade may be? Commissioner, sir, he said gruffly. Uniform away for repairs. And you were, I asked, with a slightly malicious glance at my companion. A sergeant, sir. Royal Marine Light Infantry, sir. No answer? Right, sir. He clicked his heels together, raised his hand in salute, and was gone. Oh, <laughs> get fucked, Watson. Chapter 3. The Lauriston Garden Mystery I confess that I was c considerably startled by this fresh proof of the practical nature of my companion's theories. My respect for his powers of analysis increased wondrously. There still remained some lurking suspicion in my mind, however, that the whole thing was a prearranged episode intended to dazzle me, though what earthly object he could have in taking me in was past my comprehension. When I looked at him, he had finished reading the note, and his eyes had assumed the vacant, lackluster expression which showed mental abstraction. How in the world did you deduce that? I asked. Deduce what? said he, petulantly. Why, that he was a retired sergeant of marines. I have no time for trifles, he answered brusquely. Then, with a smile, excuse my rudeness, you broke the thread of my thoughts, but perhaps it is as well. So you actually were not able to see that the man was a sergeant of the marines? No, indeed. It was easier to know to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, yet you are quite sure of the fact. Even across the street I could see a great blue anchor tattooed on the back of the fellow's hand. That smacked of the sea. He had a military carriage, however, and regulation side whiskers. There we have the marine. He was a man with some amount of self-importance and a certain air of command. He must have observed the way in which he held his hand and swung his cane. A steady, respectable, middle-aged man, too, on the faces of him, all facts which led me to believe that he had been a sergeant. Wonderful, I ejaculated. Commonplace, said Holmes, though I thought from his expression that he was pleased at my evident surprise and admiration. I said just now that there were no criminals. It appears that I am wrong. Look at this. He threw me over the note which the commissionaire had brought. Why? I cried as I cast my eye over it. This is terrible. It does seem to be a little bit out of the common, he remarked calmly. Would you mind reading it to me aloud? This is the letter which I read to him. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, there has been a bad business during the night at three Lauriston Gardens off the Brixton Road. Our men on the beat saw a light there about two in the morning, and as the house was an empty one, suspected that something was amiss. He found the door open, and in the front room, which is bare of furniture, discovered the body of a gentleman, well-dressed, and having cards in his pocket bearing the, bearing the name of Enoch J. Drever, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. There had been no robbery, nor was there any evidence as to how the man met his death. There are marks of blood in the room, but there is no wound upon his person. We are at a loss as to how he came into the empty house. Indeed, the whole affair is a puzzler. If you can come round to the house any time before twelve, you will find me there. I have left everything in statu quo, in statu quo, until I hear from you. If you are unable to come, I shall give you fuller details and would esteem it a great kindness if you would favor me with your opinions. Yours faithfully, Tobias Gregson. Ooh, ooh. we have our first mystery, fellows. My frog squad.
Next mix. Gregson is the smartest of the Scotland Yarders, my friend remarked. He and Lestrade are the pick of a bad lot. They are both quick and energetic, but conventional. Shockingly so. They have their knives into one another, too. They're as jealous as a pair of professional beauties. It'll be so f some fun over this case if they are both put upon the scent. I was amazed at the calm by which he ri rippled on. Surely there is not a moment to be lost, I cried. Shall I go and order you a cab? I'm not sure about whether I shall go. I'm the most incurably lazy devil that ever stood in shoe leather. That is, when the fit is on me, for I can be spry enough at times. Why, it is just such a, such a chance as you have been longing for. My dear fellow, what does it matter to me? Suppose I travel the whole matter. You may be sure that Gregson, Lestrade and co. will pocket all the credit. That comes of being an unofficial personage. But he begs you to help him. Yes, he knows that I am his superior, and he acknowledges it to me, but he would cut his tongue out before he would own it to any third person. However, may, we may as well go and have a look. I shall work it out on my own hook. I may have a laugh at them, if I have nothing else. Come on. He hustled on his overcoat and bustled about in a way that showed that an energetic fit had superseded his, the apathetic one. Get your hat. He's, get your hat, he said. You wish me to come? Yes, if you have nothing better to do. A minute later, we were both in a hansom, driving furiously for the Brixton Road. It was a foggy, cloudy morning, and a dun-coloured veil hung over the house tops, looking like the reflection of the mud-coloured streets beneath. My companion was in the best of spirits and prattled away about Cremona fiddles and the difference between a Stradivarius and an, and an Amati. Those are kinds of violin. As for myself, I was silent, for the dull weather and the melancholy business upon which we were engaged depressed my spirits. You don't seem, you don't seem to give much thought to the matter in hand, I said at last, interrupting Holmes's musical disquisition. No data yet, he answered. It is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence. It biases the judgment. You will have your data soon, I remarked, pointing with my finger. This is Br the Brixton Road, and that is the house, if I'm not very much mistaken. So it is. Stop, driver, stop. We were still a hundred yards or so from it, but he insisted upon our alighting, and we finished our journey upon foot. Number three, Lauriston Gardens, wore an ill-omened and minatory look. It was one of four which stood back some little way from the street, two being occupied and two empty. The latter looked out with three tiers of vacant, melancholy windows, which were blank and dreary, save that here and there a two-let card had developed like a cataract upon the bleared panes. A small garden, sprinkled over with a scattered eruption of sickly plants, separated each of these houses from the street, and was traversed by a narrow pathway, yellowish in color, consisting apparently of a mixture of clay and of gravel. The whole place was very sloppy from the rain which had fallen through the night. The garden was bounded by a three-foot brick wall with a fringe of wood rails upon the top, and against this wall was leaning a stalwart police constable, surrounded by a small knot of loafers who craned their neck and strained their eyes in the vain hope of catching some glimpse of the proceedings within. I had imagined that Sir Sherlock Holmes would have at once have hurried into the house and plunged into a study of the mystery. Nothing appeared to be further from his intention. With an air of nonchalance, which, under the circumstances, seemed to me to border upon affectation, he lounged up and down the pavement and gazed vacantly at the ground, the sky, the opposite housings, and the line of railings. Having finished his scrutiny, he proceeded slowly down the path, or rather down the fringe of grass which flanked the path, keeping his eyes riveted upon the ground. Twice he stopped, and once I saw him smile and heard him utter an exclamation of, of satisfaction. There were many marks of footsteps upon the wet, clayey soil. But since the police had been coming and going over it, I was unable to see how my companion could hope to learn anything from it. Still, I had such extraordinary evidence of the quickness of his perceptive faculties that I had no doubt that he could see a great deal which was hidden from me. At the door of the house, we were met by a tall, white-faced, flaxen-haired man with a notebook in his hand, who rushed forward and wrung my companion's hand with effusion. It is indeed kind of you to come he said. I have had everything left untouched. Ex 
except that, my friend answered, pointing at the pathway, if a herd of buffaloes had passed along, there could not be a greater mess. No doubt, however, you had drawn your own conclusions, Drexen, before you permitted this. I have had so much to do inside the house, the detective said evasively. My colleague, Mr. Lestrade, is here. I had relied upon him to look after this. Holmes glanced at me and raised his eyebrows sardonically. With two such men as yourself and Lestrade upon the ground, there will not be much for a third party to find out, he said. Gregson rubbed his hands in a self-satisfied way. I think we have done all that can be done, he answered. It's a queer case, though, and I knew your taste for such things. You did not come here in a cab, asked Sherlock Holmes. No, sir. Nor Lestrade? No, sir. Then let us go and look at the room. With which inconsequent remark, he strode on into the house, followed by Brixen, whose features expressed his astonishment. A short passage, bare planked and dusty, led it to the kitchen and offices. Two doors opened out of it to the left and to the right. One of these had obviously been closed for many weeks. The other belonged to the dining room, which was the apartment in which the mysterious affair had occurred. Holmes walked in, and I followed him with that subdued feeling in my heart which the presence of death inspires. It was a large square room, looking all the larger from the absence of all furniture. A vulgar flaring paper adorned the walls, but it was botched in places with mildew. And here and there great strips had become detached and hung down, exposing the yellow plaster beneath. Opposite the door was a showy fireplace, surmounted by a mantelpiece of imitation white marble. On one corner of this was stuck the stump of a red wax candle. The solitary window was so dirty that the light was hazy and uncertain, giving a dull gray tinge to everything, which was intensified by the thick layer of dust which coated the whole apartment. All these details I observed afterward. At present, my attention was centered upon the single, grim, motionless figure with lady, which lay stretched upon the boards, with vacant, sightless eyes staring up at the discolored ceiling. It was that of a man about forty-three or forty-four years of age, middle-sized, broad-shouldered, with crisp, curling black hair and a short, stubbly beard. He was dressed in a heavy broadcloth frock coat and waistcoat with light-colored trousers and immaculate collar and cuffs. A top hat, well-brushed and trim, was placed upon the floor beside him. His hands were clenched and his arms thrown abroad, while his lower limbs were interlocked, as though his death struggle had been a grievous one. On his rigid face there stood an expression of horror and, as it seemed to me, of hatred such as I have never seen upon human features. This malignant and terrible contortion, combined with the low forehead, blunt nose, and prognathous jaw, gave the dead man a singularly simious and ape-like appearance, which was increased by his writhing, unnatural posture. I have seen death in many forms, but never has it appeared to me in a more fearsome aspect than in that dark, grimy apartment, which looked out upon one of the main articles of suburban London. Lestrade, lean and ferret-like as ever, was standing by the doorway and greeted my companion and myself. This case will make a stir, sir, he remarked. It beats anything I have seen, and I am no chicken. <laughs> there is no clue, said Gregson. None at all, chimed in Lestrade. Sherlock Holmes approached the body and, kneeling down, examined it intently. You are sure there is no wound? he asked, pointing to numerous gouts and splashes of blood which lay all round. Positive! cried both detectives. Then, of course, this blood belongs to a second individual, presumably the murderer, if murder has been committed. It reminds me of the circumstances attendant on the death of Van Jansen in Utrecht in the year 34. Do you remember the case, Gregson? Hey -o. We re Sherlock Holmes. Mystery time. No, sir. Read it up. You really should. There is nothing new under the sun. It has all been done before. As he spoke, his nimble fingers were flying here, there, and everywhere, feeling, pressing, unbuttoning, examining, while his eyes wore the same faraway expression which I have already rem remarked upon. So swiftly was the examination made that one would hardly have guessed the minuteness with which it was conducted. Finally, he sniffed the dead man's lips and then glanced at the soles of his patent leather boots. He has not been moved at all, he asked. No more than was necessary for the purpose of our examination. You can take him to the mortuary now. 
he said. There is nothing more to be learned. Rexton had a stretcher and four men at hand. At his call, they entered the room, and the stranger was lifted and carried out. As they raised him, a ring tinkled down and rolled across the floor. Lestrade grabbed it up and stared at it with mystified eyes. There's been a woman here, he cried. It's a woman's wedding ring. He held it out, and as he, sp he held it out as he spoke upon the palm of his hand. We all gathered round him and gazed at it. There could be no doubt that the circlet of plain gold had once adorned the finger of a bride. This complicates matters, said Gregson. Heaven knows they were complicated enough before. You're sure it doesn't simplify them, observed Holmes. There's nothing to be learned by staring at it. What did you find in his pockets? We have it all here, said Gregson, pointing to a litter of objects upon one of the bottom steps of the stairs. A gold watch, number 97163, by Baroud of London. Gold Albert chain. A watch chain with thick links, named for Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband. Very heavy and solid. Gold ring with Masonic device. Gold pin, bulldog's head with rubies as eyes. Russian leather card case with the cards of Enoch J. Dreber of Cleveland, responding with, corresponding with the EJD upon the linen. No purse, but loose money to the extent of £7.13. Pock edition... Pocket edition of Boccaccio's Decameron, with name of Joseph Stangerson upon the flyleaf. Two letters, one addressed to E.J. Dreber and one to Joseph Strangerson. At what address? American Exchange, Strand. To be left till called for. They're both from the Guion Steamship Company and refer to the sailing of their boats from Liverpool. It is clear that this unfortunate man was about to return to New York. Have you made any inquiries as to this man Strangerson? I did it once, sir, said Gregson. I have had advertisements sent to all the newspapers, and one of my men has gone to the American Exchange, but he has not returned yet. Have you sent to Cleveland? We telegraphed this morning. How did you word your inquiries? He simply detailed the circumstances and said that uh, we would be glad of any information which could help us. You did not ask for particulars on any point which appeared to you to be crucial. I asked about Stangerson. Nothing else. Is there no circumstance on which this whole case appears to hinge? Will you not telegraph again? I've said that all I have to say, said Gregson in an offended voice. Sherlock Holmes chuckled to himself and appeared to be about to make some remark when Lestrade, who had been in, in the front room while we were holding this conversation in the hall, reappeared upon the scene, rubbing his hands in a pompous and self-satisfied manner. Mr. Gregson? He said, I have just made a discovery of the highest importance, what which would have been overlooked had I not made a careful examination of the walls. The little man's eyes sparkled as he spoke, and he was evidently in a state of suppressed exultation, having scored a point against his colleague. Come here, he said, bustling back into the room, the atmosphere of which felt clearer since the removal of its ghastly end paint. Now, stand there. He struck a match on his boot and held it up against the wall. Look at that, he said triumphantly. I have remarked that the paper had fallen away in parts. In this particular corner of the room, a large piece had peeled off, leaving a yellow square of coarse plastering. Across this bare space, there was scrawled in blood-red letters a single word, Racha. What do you think of that? said the detective. With the air of a showman exhibiting his show. This was overlooked because it was in the darkest corner of the room, and no one thought of looking there. The murder has written it with his or her own blood. See the smear would it is trickled down the wall. That dip disposes the idea of suicide, anyhow. What was this quarter chosen to write it on? I will tell you. See that candle on the mantelpiece? It was lit at the time, and if it was lit, this corner would be the brightest instead of the darkest portion of the wall. And what does it mean now that you have found it? asked Gregson in a depreciatory tone. Mean? Why, it means the writer was going to put the female name Rachel, but was disturbed before he or she had time to finish. You mark my words, when this case comes to be cleared up, you will find that a woman named Rachel has something to do with it. It's all very well for you to laugh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You may be very smart and clever, but the old hound is the best when all is said and done. I beg your pardon, said my companion, who had ruffled the little man's temper by bursting into an explosion of laughter. 
You certainly have the credit for being the first of us to find this out. And, as you say, it bears every mark of having been written by the other participant in last night's mystery. I have not had time to examine this room yet, but with your permission, I shall do so now. As he spoke, he whipped a tape measure and a large round magnifying glass from his pocket. With these two implements, he trotted noiselessly about the room, sometimes stopping, occasionally kneeling, and once lying flat upon his face. So engrossed was he with his occupation that he himself seemed to uh, appear to have forgotten our presence, for he chattered away to himself under his breath the whole time, keeping up a running fire of exclamations, groans, whistles, and little cries of suggestive encouragement and hope. As I watched him, I was irresistibly reminded of a pure-blooded, well-trained foxhound as it dashes backward and forward through the covert, whining in its eagerness until it comes across the lost scent. For twenty minutes or more, he continued his researches, measuring with the most exact care the distance between marks, which were entirely invisible to me, and occasionally applying his tape to the walls in an equally incomprehensible manner. In one place, he gathered up very carefully a little pile of grey dust from the floor and packed it away in an envelope. Finally, he examined with his glass the word upon the wall, going over every letter with the most minute exactness. This done, he appeared to be satisfied, for he replaced his tape and his glass in his pocket. They say the genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains, he remarked with a smile. It's a very bad definition, but it does apply to detective work. Gregson and Lestrade had watched the maneuvers of their amateur companion with considerable curiosity and some contempt. They evidently failed to appreciate the fact, which I had begun to realize, that Sherlock Holmes's smallest actions were all directed towards some definite and practical end. "'What do you think of it, sir?' they both asked. "'It would be robbing you of the credit of the case if I were to presume to help you,' remarked my friend. "'You are doing so well now that it would be a pity for anyone to interfere.' There was a world of sarcasm in his voice as we spoke. If you will let me know how your investigations go, he continued, I shall be happy to give you any help I can. In the meantime, I should like to speak to the constable who found the body. Can you give me his name and address? The Strad glanced at his notebook. John Rance, he said. He's off on duty now. You'll find him at 46 Audley Court, Kennington Park Gate. Holmes took a note of the address. Come along, Doctor. You shall go and look at him up. I'll tell you one thing, which... May I help you in the case, he continued, turning to the detectives. There has been murder done, and the murderer was a man. He was more than six feet high, was in the prime of life, had small feet for his height, wore coarse, square-toed boots, and spoke and smoked a trichinopoly cigar. He came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab, which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and one new one on his off foreleg. In all probability, the murderer had a florid face, and the fingernails on his right hand were remarkably long. These are only a few indications, but they may assist you. Lestrade and Gregson glanced at each other with an incredulous smile. If this man was murdered, how was it done? asked the former. Poison, said Sherlock Holmes curtly, and strode off. One other thing, Lestrade, he added, turning round the corner. Rache is the German for revenge, so don't lose your time looking for Miss Rachel. With which Parthenian shot, he walked away, leaving the two rivals open-mouthed behind him. <laughs> Damn. What John Rance had to tell. John Ranch. Ranch dressing. Chapter 4. It was one o'clock when we left number three Lauriston Gardens. Sherlock Holmes led me to the nearest telegraph office, where he dispatched a long telegram. He then hailed a cab and ordered the driver to take us to the address given to us by Lestrade. There is nothing like first-hand evidence, he remarked. As a matter of fact, my mind is entirely made up upon the case, but still we may as well learn all that is to be learned. You amaze me, Holmes, said I. Surely you are not as sure as you pretend to be of all those particulars which you gave. There's no room for a mistake, he answered. The first thing which I observed on arriving here was that a cab had made two ruts with its wheels close to the curb. Now, up to last night, we have had no rain for a week, so that those wheels which 
which left such a deep impression, must have been left there during the night. There were the marks of the horse's hooves, too, which the outline of one of which was far more clearly cut than that of the other three, showing that that was a new shoe. Since the cab was there after the rain again began, but was not there at any time during the morning, I have Gregson's word for that, it follows that it must have been there during the night, and therefore that it brought those two individuals to the house. That seems simple enough, said I, but how about the other man's height? Why, the height of a man, in nine cases out of ten, can be told from the length of his stride. It is a simple cap calculation enough, though there is no use in my boring you with the figures. I had this fellow's stride, both on the clay outside and on the dust within. Excuse me, I yawn. Goodness. Then I had a way of checking my calculation. When a man writes on a wall, his instinct leads him to write above the level of his own eyes. Now that writing was just over six feet from the ground. It was child's play. And his age? I asked. Well, if a man can stride four and a half feet without the smallest effort, he can't be quite in the sear and yellow. That was the breadth of a puddle on the garden walk, which he had eventually, evidently walked across. Patent leather boots had gone round, and square-toed ones had hopped over. There is no mystery about it at all. I am simply applying to ordinary life a few of those precepts of observation and deduction which I advocated in that article. Is there anything that puzzles me? That puzzles you. The fingernails in the trichinopoly, I suggested. The writing on the wall was done with a man's forefinger dipped in blood. My glass allowed me to observe that the plaster was slightly scratched in doing it, which would not have been the case if the man's nail had been trimmed. I gathered up some scattered ash from the floor. Excuse me. It was dark in colour and flaky, such an ash is only made by a trichinopoly. I have made a special study of cigar ashes. In fact, I have written a, a monograph upon the subject. I flatter myself that I can distinguish at a glance the ash of any known brand, of, either of cigar or of tobacco. It is just in such details that the skilled detective differs from the Gregson and Lestrade type. And the florid face? I asked. Ah, that was a more daring shot, though I have no doubt that I was right. You must not ask me that at the present state of the affair. I passed my hand over my brow. My head is in a whirl, I remarked. The more one thinks of it, the more mysterious it grows. How came these two men, if there were two men, into an empty house? What has become of the cabmen who drove them? How could one man compel another to take poison? Where did the blood come from? What was the object of the murderer, since robbery had no part in it? How, how came the wounds ring there? Above all, why would the second man write up the German word Rache before decamping? I confess that I cannot see any possible way of reconciling all these facts. My companion smiled approvingly. You sum up the difficulty. Hello. We're reading Sherlock Holmes. It's a mystery, so I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, other than my delightful visage. What is is my bouncing bobbling head? <laughs> Not enough. No, it's it's just me chatting. Just me chatting, reading story time for story time Saturday. Nice. Glad to hear it. It is a classic for a reason. It's intriguing. You sum up the difficulties of, this, of the situation succinctly and well, he said. There is much that is still obscure. Though I have quite made up my mind on the main facts, as to Paul Lestrade's discovery, it was simply a blind intended to put the police upon a wrong track. By suggesting socialism and secret societies, it was not done by a German. The A, if you noticed, was printed somewhat after the German fashion. Now, a real German invariably prints in the Latin character. Yeah, 
But we're just we're just learning about the mystery so far. The first few chapters were really to just introduce Sherlock Holmes. So basically, a dead body of a dude was found in an abandoned house. There are no wounds on the guy, but there was blood splashed around the room. And Sherlock comes in and he's like, okay, so there was another dude about like a little bit above six feet tall who was in here, you know, who, who must have been the one who spilled the blood. Anyway, see you later, detective nerds. I'm a better detective than both of you. And that's where we left off. And Watson's here just going, wow. Big brain. And the word Rache, which is revenge in German, was written on the wall in blood. Woo! The A, if you noticed, was printed somewhat after the German fashion. Now, a real German invariably prints in the Latin character, so that we may safely say that this was not written by one, but by a clumsy imitator who overdid his part. It was simply a ruse to divert inquiry into a wrong channel. I'm not going to tell you much more of the case, Doctor. You know a conjurer gets no credit when he is a when once he has explained his trick, and if I show you too much of my method of working, you will come to the conclusion that I am a very ordinary individual after all. A magician never reveals his secrets. A detective never reveals his deductions. Ho ho. Sip, sip, drink water. I shall never do that, I answered. You have brought direction as near an exact science. Detection is near an exact science as it ever will be brought in this world. My companion flushed up the pleasure at my words and the earnest way in which I authored them. I had already observed that he was as sensitive to, sla to flattery on the score of his art as any girl could be of her beauty. <sighs> oh, Sherlock is a fan of compliments, but only when they compliment his big Brian. Big brain? All thoughts, head full. Except not with the knowledge that the Earth goes around the sun. He doesn't know that and is actively trying to forget. I'll tell you one other thing, he said. Patent leathers and square toes came in the same cab and they walked down the pathway together as friendly as possible. Arm in arm, in all probability. When they got in, inside they walked up and down the room. Or rather, patent leathers stood while square toes walked up and down. I could read all that in the dust, and I could read that as he walked, he grew more and more excited. That is showed by the increased length of his strides. He was talking all the while, and working himself up, no doubt, into a fury. Then the tragedy occurred. I've told you all I know myself for now. For the rest is mere surmise and conjecture. We have a good working basis, however, on which to start. You must hurry up, for I want to go to Halley's concert to hear Norman Neruda this afternoon. This conversation had occurred while our cab had been threading its way through a long succession of dingy streets and dreary byways. In the dingiest and dreariest of them, our dry driver came, suddenly came to a stand. That's oddly caught in there, he said, pointing to a narrow slit in, in the line of dead-colored brick. You'll find me here when you come back. Oddly Court was not an attractive locality. The narrow passage led us into a quadrangle paved with flags and lined by sordid dwellings. We picked our way among groups of dirty children and through lines of discolored linen until we came to number 46, the door of which was decorated with a small slip of brass on which the name Rance was engraved. On inquiry, we found that the constable was in bed and we were shown into a little front parlor to await his coming. He appeared presently, looking a little irritable at being disturbed in his slumbers. I made my report at the office, he said. Holmes took a half sovereign from his pocket and played with it pensively. We thought that we should like to hear it all from your own lips. I shall be most happy to tell you anything I can, the constable answered, with his eyes upon the little golden disc. Just let it hear it all let us hear it all in your own way as it occurred. Rance sat, sat down on the horsehair sofa and knitted his brows, as though determined not to omit anything in his narrative. 
I'll tell it you from the beginning. My time is from 10 at night to 6 in the morning. At 11, there is a fight at the White Hart, but bar that all was quiet enough on the beat. At 1 o'clock at the band and rain, and I met Harry Mercher, him who was the uh, Holland Grove beat, and we stood together at the corner of Henrietta Street talk talking. Presently, maybe about 2 or a little after, I thought we would take a look round, see that all was right down at the Brixton Road. It was precious dirty and lonely. Not a soul did I meet all the way down. Though a cab or two went past me. I was a strolling down, thinking between ourselves how uncommonly handy a for a gin art would be, when suddenly a glint of a light caught my eye in the window of that same house. Now I knew that the um, two houses in Lauriston Gardens were empty on account of him that owns them, who won't have the drained seed to. Won't have the drained seed to, though the very last tenant that lived in one of them died of typhoid fever. I was knocked all in a heat, therefore, I'd seen a light in the window and expected something was wrong. When I got to the door, you stopped and then walked back to the garden gate. My companion interrupted. What did you do that for? Rance gave a violent jump and stared at Sherlock Holmes with the utmost amazement upon his features. Why, that's true, sir. Though how you come to know it, heaven only knows. You see, when I got up to the door, it was so still and so lonesome that I thought I'd be none the worse for someone with me. I ain't afeard of anything on this side of the grave, but I thought, well, maybe it was him that died of the typhoid inspecting the drains what killed him. The thought gave me kind of turn, and I walked back to the gate to see if I could get Murcher's lantern, but there wasn't no sign of him nor anyone else. There was no one in the street. Not a living soul, sir, nor as much as a dog. And I pulled myself together and went back and pushed the door open. All was quiet inside, so I went into the room where the light was a burning. There was a candle flickering on the mantelpiece, a red wax one, and by its light I, I saw... Yes, I know all that you saw. You walked around the room several times, and you knelt down by the body, and then you walked through and tried the kitchen door, and then... John Ranch... Ranch... John Ranch... John Ranch sprang to his feet with a frightened face and suspicion in his eyes. <laughs> Where was you in to see all that? He cried. It seems to me that you know a deal more than you should. Holmes laughed and threw his card across the table to the constable. Don't go arresting me for the murder, he said. I am one of the hounds and not the wolf. Mr. Gregston or Mr. Lestrade will answer for that. Go on, though. What did you do next? Rance resumed his seat without, however, losing his mystified expression. I went back to the gate and sounded my whistle. That brought Murcher and two more to the spot. Was the street empty then? Well, it was as far as anybody that could be of any good goes. What do you mean? Constable's features broadened into a grin. I've seen many a drunk chap in my time. He said, but never anyone so crying drunk as that cove. He was at the gate when I came out, a leaning up against the railings and a singing at the picture of his lungs about Columbine's newfangled banger or some stuff. He couldn't stand for less help. What sort of a man was he? asked Sherlock Holmes. John Rance appeared to be somewhat irritated at the digression. He was an uncommon drunk sort of man, he said. He'd have found himself in the station if we hadn't been so took up. His face, his dress, didn't you notice them? Holmes broke in impatiently. I should think I did notice something that I had to prop him up, me and Murcher between us. He was a long chap with a red face, the lower part muffled round. That'll do, cried Holmes. What became of him? We'd enough to do without looking after him, the policeman said, and in a grief tone. I'll wager it found his way home, all right. How was he dressed? Brown overcoat. Had he a whip in his hand? A, a whip? No. You must have left it behind, muttered my companion. You didn't happen to see or hear a cab after that. No. There's a half sovereign for you, my companion said, standing up and taking his hat. I am afraid, Rance, that you will never rise in the force. That head of yours should be for use as well as an ornament. You might have gained your sergeant's stripes last night. The man whom you held in your hands is the man who holds the clue of this mystery and whom we are seeking. There is no use of arguing about it now. I tell you that it is so. Come along, doctor. 
<laughs> Rance, you're useless. Oh, heck. Uh, excuse me a moment. I just spilled my water. All right, the flood has been cleared. Everything's safe. Everything's fine. Everything's kosher. Everything's cool. Dill pickle. Okay. What's better than being cool? Ice cold. Here we go. All right. We started off for the cab together, leaving our informant incredulous, but obviously uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, I would understand why. Holmes just call him a straight-up bumbling simpleton. So, that blundering fool, Holmes said as we said bitterly as we drove back to our lodgings. Just to think of his having such an incomparable bit of good luck and not taking advantage of it. I am rather in the dark still. Is it true that the description of this man tallies with your idea of the second... It is true that the description of this man tallies with your idea of the second party in this mystery. But why should he come back to the house after leaving it? That is not the way of criminals. 
The ring, man. The ring. That was what he came back for. If we have no other way of catching him, we can always bait our line with the ring. I shall have him, Doctor. I'll lay you two to one that I have him. I must thank you for it all. I might have gone but for you, and so have missed the finest study I ever came across. A study in scarlet, eh? Why shouldn't we use a little art jargon? There's the scarlet thread of murder running through the colourless skein of life, and our duty is to unravel it and isolate it and expose every inch of it. And now for lunch, and then for Norman Neruda. Her attack and her bowing are splendid. Is that little thing of Chopin's she plays so magnificently? tra la 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 Leaning back in the cab, this amateur bloodhound caroled away like a lark while I meditated upon the many-sidedness of the human mind. What little thing, indeed. Frederick Chopin wrote nothing for the solo viol violin. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think Chopin had written anything for the violin. His stuff's usually on piano, right? Sip, sip, replacement water. Ha-ha. <laughs> Chapter 5. Our advertisement brings a visitor. Exciting. Our morning's exertions had been too much for my weak health, and I was tired out in the afternoon. After Holmes's departure for the concert, I lay down upon the sofa and endeavored to get a couple of hours sleep. It was a useless attempt. My mind had been too much excited by all that had occurred, and the strangest fancies and surmises crowded into it. Every time that I closed my eyes, I saw before me this distorted, baboon-like countenance of the murdered man. So sinister was the impression which that face had produced upon me that I found it difficult to feel anything but gratitude for him who had removed its owner from the world. If ever human features bespoke vice of the most malignant type, they were certainly those of Enoch J. Dreber of Cleveland. Still, I recognized that justice must be done and that the depravity of the victim was no, no condonement in the eyes of the law. I <laughs> so <laughs> apparently this dude's face is so butt ugly that Watson thinks he deserved to die <laughs> or some somehow <laughs> somehow something about this dude's face betrayed great vice perhaps greed or something and so Watson thinks he deserved to be murdered <laughs> jeez Almost as judgmental as Alice up in here, Jesus. The more I thought thought of it, the more. Ex yeah, uh, yeah, real, real upstanding citizen there, Watson. Doctor, the good doctor. The more I thought of it, the more extraordinary did my companion's hypothesis that the man had been poisoned appear. I remember how he had sniffed his lips and had no doubt that he had detected something which had given rise to the idea. Then again, if not poison, what had caused the man's death, since there was neither wound nor marks of strangulation? But on the other hand, whose blood was that which lay so thickly upon the floor? There were no signs of struggle, nor had the victim any weapon with which he might have wounded an antagonist. As long as all these questions were unresolved, I found that sleep would be no easy matter, either for Holmes or myself. His quiet, self-confident manner convinced me that he had already formed a theory which explained all the facts, though what it was I could not for an instant conjecture. He was very late in returning, so late that I knew that the concert could not have detained him all that time. Dinner was on the table before he appeared. He was late for dinner! How could he? How rude! So root. It was magnificent, he said as he took his seat. Do you remember what Darwin says about music? He claims that the power of producing and appreciating it existed among the human race long before the power of speech was arrived at. Perhaps that is why we are so subtly influenced by it. There are vague memories in our souls of those misty centuries when the world was in its childhood. It's a rather broad idea, I remarked. One's ideas must be as broad as nature if they are to interpret nature. 
he answered. What's the matter? You're not looking quite yourself. This Brixton Road affair has upset you. To tell the truth, it has, I said. I ought to be more case-hardened after my Afghan experiences. I saw my own comrades hacked to pieces at my wand without losing my nerve. I can understand. There is a mystery about this which stimulates the imagination. When there is no imagination, there is no horror. Have you seen the evening paper? No. It gives a fairy, fairly good account of the affair. It does not mention the fact that when the men, man was raised up, a woman's wedding ring fell upon the floor. It is just as well it does not. Why? Look at this advertisement, he answered. I had one sent to every paper this morning immediately after the affair. He threw the paper across to me, and I glanced at the place indicated. It was the first announcement in the found column. In Brixton Road this morning, it rang, a plain gold wedding ring found in the roadway between the White Hart Tavern and Holland Grove. Apply Dr. Watson, 221B Baker Street, between 8 and 9 this evening. Excuse me using your name, he said. If I used my own, some of these dunderheads would recognize it and want to meddle in the affairs. That is all right, I answered, but supposing anyone applies, I have no ring. Oh, yes, you have, said he, handing me one. This will do very well. It is almost a facsimile. And who do you expect will answer this advertisement? Why, the man in the brown coat, our florid friend with the square, she square, square toes. If he does not come himself, he was then an accomplice. Would he not consider it as too dangerous? Not at all. If my view of the case is correct, and I have every reason to believe that it is, the man would rather risk anything than lose the ring. According to my notion, he dropped it while stooping over, Do over Drebber's body, and did not miss it at the time. After leaving the house, he discovered his loss and hurried back, but found the police already in possession, owing to his own folly in leaving the candle burning. He had to pretend to be drunk in order to lay the suspicions which might have been aroused by his appearance at the gate. Now put yourself in that man's place. On thinking the matter over, it must have occurred to him that it was possible that he had lost the ring in the road after leaving the house. What would he do then? He would eagerly look out for the evening papers in the hope of seeing it among the articles found. His eye, of course, would light upon this. He would be overjoyed. Why should he fear a trap? There would be no reason in his eyes why the finding of the ring should be connected with the murder. He would come. He will come. You shall see him within an hour. And then? I asked. Oh, you can leave me to deal with him then. Have you any arms? I have my old service revolver and a few cartridges. You would better clean it and load it. He will be a desperate man, and though I shall take him unawares, it is as well to be ready for anything. Well, thanks, Sherlock. Just inviting a possible murderer to the house. Just, you know, chilling out. Really appreciate that. I went up to my bedroom and followed his advice. When I returned with the pistol, the table had been cleared, and Holmes was engaged in his favorite occupation of scraping upon his violin. The plot thickens, he said as I entered. I have just had an answer to my American telegram. My view of the case is the correct one. And that is, I asked either, eagerly. "'My fiddle would be the better for new strings,' he remarked. "'Put your pistol in your pocket. "'When the fellow comes, speak to him in an ordinary way. "'Leave the rest to me. "'Don't frighten him by looking at him too hard.' "'It is eight o'clock now,' I said, glancing at my watch. "'Yes, he will probably be here in a few minutes. "'Open the door slightly. That will do. "'Now put the key on the inside. Thank you. "'This is a queer old book I picked up at a store yesterday. "'De jure interquente, of international law, literally of law among peoples.' Published in Latin at Liege and in the Lowlands in 1642, Charles's head was still firm on his shoulders when his, this little brown-backed volume was struck off. Who's the printer? Philip de Croix, whoever he may have been. On the fly-leaf in very fa faded ink is written Ex Libris Guillaume White. I wonder who William White was. Some pragmatical 17th century lawyer, I suppose. His writing has a legal twist about it. Here comes our man, I think. After, As he spoke, there was a sharp ring at the bell. Sherlock Holmes rose softly and moved his chair in the direction of the door. 
We heard the servant pass along the hall and the sharp click of the latch as she opened it. Does Dr. Watson live here? Asked a clear but rather harsh voice. We could not hear the servant's reply, but the door closed and someone began to ascend the stairs. The footfall was an uncertain and shuffling one. A look of surprise packed over the face of my companion as he listened to it. It came slowly along the passage and there was a feeble tap at the door. Come in, I cried. At my summons, instead of the man of violence whom we expected, a very old and wrinkled woman hobbled into the apartment. She appeared to be dazzled by the sudden blaze of light, and after dropping a curtsy, she stood blinking at us with her bleared eyes and fumbling in her pocket with nervous, shaky fingers. I glanced at my companion, and his face had assumed such a disconsolate expression that it was all I could do to keep my countenance. The old crone drew out an evening paper and pointed at, it, at our advertisement. It's this as has brought me, good gentleman, she said, dropping another curtsy. A gold wedding ring in the Brixton Road. It belongs to my girl Sally, as was married only this time twelve months, when her husband is steward aboard a union boat. Headed to South Africa. And what he'd say if he comes home, comes home and finds her without a ring is more than I can think. He being short enough at the best of times, but, this, but more especially when he has the drink. If it please you, she went to the circus last night along with... Is that her ring? I asked. The Lord be thanked, cried the old woman. Sally would be a glad woman this night. That's the ring. And what may your address be? I inquired, taking up a pencil. 13 Duncan Street, Houndstitch. A weary way from here. The Brixton Road does not lie between any circus. The Brixton Road does not lie between any circus and Houndstitch, said Sherlock Holmes sharply. The old woman faced round and looked keenly at him from her little red-rimmed eyes. The gentleman asked me for my address, she said. Sally lives in lodgings at 3 Mayfield Place, Peckham. And your name is... My name is Sawyer. Hers is Dennis, which Tom Dennis married her, and a smart, clean lad, too, as long as he's at sea and no steward and the company more thought of. But when on shore, what with the women and what with liquor shops... Here's your ring, Mrs. Sawyer, I interrupted, in obedience to a sign from my companion. It clearly belongs to your daughter, and I'm glad to be able to restore it to its rightful owner. With many mumbled blessings and protestations of gratitude, the old crone packed it away in her pocket and shuffled off down the stairs. Sherlock Holmes sprang to his feet the moment that she was gone and rushed into his room. He returned in a few seconds, enveloped in an ulster and a cravat. I'll follow her, he said hurriedly. She must be an accomplice and will lead me to him. Wait up for me. The hall door had hardly slammed behind our visitor before Holmes had descended the stair. Looking through the window, I could see her walking feebly along the other side, while her pursuer dog dogged her some distance, some little distance behind. Either this whole theory is incorrect, I thought to myself, or else he will be led now to the heart of the mystery. There was no need for him to ask me to wait up for him, for I felt that sleep was impossible until I heard the result of this adventure. It was close upon nine when he set out. I had no idea how long he might be, but I sat stolidly puffing at my pipe and skipping over the pages of Henry Merger's Via de, Bo Via de Bohème. Ten o'clock passed, and I heard the footsteps of the maid as she pattered off to bed. Eleven, and the more stately tread of the landlady passed my door, bound for the same destination. It was close upon twelve before I heard the sharp sound of his latchkey. The instant he entered, I saw by his face that he had not been successful. Amusement and chagrin seemed to be struggling for the mastery until the former suddenly carried the day and he burst into a hearty laugh. I wouldn't have the Scotland Yarders know it for the world, he cried, dropping into his chair. I have chaffed them so much that they would never have let me hear the end of it. Can afford to laugh because I know that I will be even with them in the long run. What is it then? I asked. Oh, I don't mind telling a story against myself. That creature had gone a little way when she began to limp and show every sign of being foot sore. Presently she came to a halt and hailed a four wheeler which which was passing. I managed to be close to her so as to hear the address, but I need not have been so anxious, for she sang it out loud enough to be heard to the other side of the street. 
Drive to 13 Duncan Street, Houndsditch, she cried. This begins to look genuine, I thought, and having seen her safely inside, I perched myself behind. That's an art which every detective should be an expert at. Well, away we rattled and never drew rain until we reached the street in question. I hopped off before we came to the door and strolled down the street in an easy lounging way. I saw the cab pull up, the driver jumped down, and I saw him open the door and stand expectantly. Nothing came out, though. When I reached him, he was groping about frantically in the empty cab and giving vent to the finest assort in the collection of oaths uh, that I, ever I listened to. There was no sign or trace of his passenger, and I fear it will be some time before he gets his fare. On inquiring at number 13, we found that the house belonged to a respectable paper hanger named Keswick, and that no one of the name of either Sawyer or Dennis had ever been heard of there. You don't mean to say, I cried in amazement, that that tottering, feeble old woman was able to get out of the cab while it was in motion without either you or the driver seeing her. Old woman be damned, said Sherlock Holmes sharply. We were the old women to be so taken in. It must have been a young man and an active one, too, besides being an incomparable actor. The get-up was inimitable. He saw that he was followed, no doubt, and used this means of giving me the slip. Shows that the man we are after is not as lonely as I imagined he was, but has friends who are ready to risk something for him. Now, Doctor, you are looking done up. Take my advice and turn in. I was certainly feeling very weary, so I obeyed his injunction. I left home seated in front of the smouldering fire, and long into the watches of the night I heard the low, melancholy wailings of his violin, and knew that he was still pondering over the strange problem which he had set himself to unravel. Bum, bum, bum. The old lady was a trap, a disguise. They were fooled, fooled. Excuse me while I break my own neck. Chapter 6. Tobias Gregson Shows What He Can Do The papers next day were full of the Brixton mystery, as they termed it. Each had a long account of the affair, and some had leaders upon it in addition. There was some information in them which was new to me. I still re retain in my scrapbook numerous clippings and extracts bearing upon the case. Here is a condensation of a few of them. The Daily Telegraph remarked that in the history of crime there had seldom been a tragedy which presented stranger features. The German name of the victim, the absence of all other motive, and the sinister inscription on the wall all pointed to its perpetration by political refugees and revolutionists. The socialists had many branches in America, and the deceased had, no doubt, infringed their unwritten laws and been tracked down by them. After alluding airily to the Ver Vemgericht, Arthur Tofana, Carbonarian, Mark Kionis de Brunvilliers, the Darwinian theory, the principles of Malthus, and the Ratcliffe Highway murders, the article concluded by admonishing the government and advocating a closer watch over foreigners in England. The Standard commented upon the fact that lawless outrages of the sort usually occurred under a liberal administration. They arose from the unsettling of the minds of the masses and the consequent weakening of all authority. The deceased was an American gentleman who had been residing for some weeks in the metropolis. He stayed at the boarding house of Madame Charpentier in Torquay Terrace, Camberwell. He was accompanied in his travels by his private secretary, Mr. Joseph Stengerson. The two bade adieu to their landlady upon Tuesday the 4th instance, and departed to Euston Station, with the avowed intention of catching the Liverpool Express. They were afterwards seen together upon the platform. Nothing more is known of them until Mr. Drebber's body was, as recorded, discovered in an empty house in the, in the Brixton Road, many miles from Euston. How he came there, or how he met his fate, are questions which are still involved in mystery. Nothing is known of the whereabouts of Stangerson. We are glad to learn that Mr. Lestrade and Mr. Gregson... Uh, Gregson of 
Scotland Yard are both engaged upon the case, and it is confidently anticipated that these well-known officers will speedily throw light upon the matter. The Daily News observed that there was no doubt as the, to the crime being a political one. The despotism and hatred of lib liberalism, which animated the continental governments, had had the effect of driving to our shores a number of men who might have made excellent citizens were they not soured by the recollection of all that they had undergone. Among these men, there was a stringent code of honor, any infringement of which was punished by death. Every effort should be made to find the secretary, Stangerson, and to ascertain some particulars of the habits of the deceased. A great step had been gained by the discovery of the address of the house at which he had boarded, a result which was entirely due to the acuteness and energy of Mr. Gregson of Scotland Yard. Sherlock Holmes and I read these notices over together at, at breakfast, and they appeared to afford him considerable amusement. I told you that whatever happened, Lestrade and Gregson would be sure to score. That depends on how it turns out. Oh, bless you, it doesn't matter in the least. If the man is caught, it will be on account of their exertions. If he escapes, it will be in spite of their exertions. It's at heads I win and tails you lose. Whatever they do, they will have followers. Un sorte trouve toujours un plus sodic qu'à l'admirer. What on earth is this? I cried. For at this moment there came the pattering of many steps in the hall and on the stairs, accompanied by audible expressions of disgust upon the part of our landlady. It's the Baker Street Division of the Detective Police Force said my companion gravely. And as he spoke, there rushed into the room half a dozen of the dirtiest and most ragged street street children that I that ever I clapped eyes on. Tensio! cried Holmes in a sharp tone. And the six dirty little scoundrels stood in a line like so many disreputable statuettes. In future you shall st send up Wiggins alone to report, and the rest of you must wait in the street. Have you found it, Wiggins? No, sir, we hain't said one of the youths. I hardly expected you would. You must keep on until you do. Here are your wages. He handed each of them a shilling. Now off you go and come back with a better report next time. He waved his hand and they scampered away downstairs like so many rats and we heard their shrill voices next moment in the street. There's more work to be got out of those little beggars than the, uh, out of a dozen of the force, Holmes remarked. Mere sight of an official-looking person seals men's lips. These youngers, youngsters, however, go everywhere and hear everything. They're as sharp as needles, too. All they want is organization. Is it on this Brixton case that you are employing them? I asked. Yes, there is a point which I wish to ascertain. It is merely a matter of time. Hello? We are going to hear some news now with a vengeance. Here is Gregson coming, Gregson coming down the road with beatitude. Written upon every feature of his face. Bound for us, I know. Yes, he is stopping. There he is. There was a violent peal at the bell. And in a few seconds, the fair-haired detective came up the stairs three steps at a time and burst into our sitting room. My dear fellow. He cried, wringing Holmes's unresponsive hand. Congratulate me. I've made the whole thing as clear as day. A shade of anxiety se seemed to meet across my companion's expressive face. Do you mean that you are on the right track? He asked. The right track? Why, sir, we have the man under lock and key. And his name is? Arthur Charpentier, sub-lieutenant in Her Majesty's Navy, cried Gregson, pompously rubbing his fat hands and inflating his chest. Sherlock, ga Sherlock Holmes gave a sigh of relief and relaxed into a smile. Take a seat and try one of these cigars, he said. We are anxious to know how you managed to do it. Will you have some whiskey and water? I don't mind if I do, the detective answered. Tremendous exertions, which I have gone through during the last day or two, have worn me out. Not so much bodily exertion, you understand, as the strain upon the mind. You'll appreciate that, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, for we are both brain workers. You do me too much honour, said Holmes gravely. Let us hear how you arrived at this most gratifying result. <laughs> I'm sure Holmes is, is for sure genuinely congratulating him right now. 
for sure. The detective seated himself in the armchair and puffed complacently at his cigar, then suddenly clapped his, slapped his thigh in a paroxysm of amusement. The fun of it is, he cried, that that fool Lestrade, who thinks himself so smart, has gone off upon the wrong track altogether. He's after the secretary Stangerson, who had no more to do with the crime than the babe unborn. I have no doubt that he has caught him by this time. The idea tickled Gregson so much that he laughed until he choked. How did you get your clue? I'll tell you about it. Of course, Dr. Watson, this is strictly between ourselves. The first difficulty which we had to contend with was the finding of this American's antecedents. Some people would have waited until their advertisements were answered or until parties came forward and volunteered information. That is not Tobias Gregson's way of going to work. You remember the hat beside the dead man? Yes, said Holmes, by John Underwood and Sons, 129 Camberwell Road. Gregson looked quite crestfallen. I had no idea that you noticed that, he said. Have you been there? No. Ha! said Gregson in a relieved voice. You should never neglect a chance, however small it may seem. To a great mind, nothing is little, remarked Holmes sententiously. Sententiously. Well, I went to Underwood and asked him if he sold, had sold a hat of that size and description. Looked over his books and came on it at once. He had sent the hat to a Mr. Drebber residing at Charpentier's boarding establishment, Torquay Terrace. Thus I got his address. Smart, very smart, murmured Sherlock Holmes. I next call upon Madame Charpentier, continued the detective. I found her very pale and distressed. Her daughter was in the room, too. Un an uncommonly fine girl she is, too. She was looking red about the eyes and her lips trembled as I spoke to her. That didn't escape my notice. I began to spoon a rat. You know the feeling, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, when you come upon the right scent, a kind of thrill in your nerves. You heard of this mysterious death of your late bard, boarder, Mr. N. J. Drebber of Cleveland, I asked. The mother nodded. She didn't seem to be able to get out a word. The daughter burst into tears. I felt more than ever that these people knew something of the matter. At what o'clock did Mr. Drebber leave your house for the train? I asked. At eight o'clock, she said gulping in her throat to keep down her agitation. His secretary, Mr. Stangerson, said that there were two trains, one at 9.15 and one at 11. He was to catch the first. And was that the last which you saw of him? A terrible change came over the woman's face as I asked the question. Her features turned perfectly livid. It was some seconds before she could get out a single word. Yes, and when it did come, it was spoke in a husky, unnatural tone. There was silence for a moment, and then the daughter spoke in a calm, clear voice. No good can ever come of falsehood, mother, she said. Let us be frank with this gentleman. We did see Mr. Drebber again. God forgive you, said Madame Champartier, throwing up her hands and shrieking back in her chair. You have murdered your brother. Arthur would rather we spoke the truth, the girl answered firmly. You had best tell me all about it now, I said. Half confidences are worse than none. Besides, you do not know how much he knew of it. On your head be it, Alice, cried her mother. And then, turning to me, I will tell you all, sir. Do not imagine that my agitation on behalf of my son arises from any fear lest he should have had a hand in this terrible affair. He is utterly innocent of it. My dread is, however, that in your eyes and the eyes of whoever he may appear to be compromised. That, however, is surely impossible. His high character, his profession, his antecedents would all forbid it. Your best way is to make a clean breast of the facts, I answered. Depend upon it. If your son is innocent, he will be none the worse. Perhaps, Alice, you would better leave us together, she said, and her daughter withdrew. Now, sir, she continued, I had no intention of telling you all this, but my, since my poor daughter has disclosed it, I have no alternative. Having once decided to speak, I would tell you all without omitting any particular. It is your wisest course, said I. 
Mr. Drebber has been with us nearly three weeks. He and his secretary, Mr. Stangerson, have been, had been traveling on the continent. I noticed a Copenhagen label on, upon each of their trunks, showing that, that that had been their last stopping place. Stangerson was a quiet, reserved man, but his employer, I'm so, sorry to say, was far otherwise. He was coarse in his habits and brutish in his ways. The very, much, the very night of his arrival, he became very much the worse for drink, and indeed, after twelve o'clock in the day, he could hardly ever be said to be sober. His manners toward the main servants were disgustingly free and familiar. Worst of all, he speedily assumed the same attitude towards my daughter, Alice, and spoke to her more than once in a way which, fortunately, she is too innocent to understand. On one occasion, he actually seized her in his arms and embraced her, an outrage which caused his own secretary to reproach him for his unmanly conduct. Ooh, unmanly conduct. Somebody in trouble. But why did you stand all this, I asked. I suppose that you can get rid of your borders when you wish. Mrs. Charpentier, Charpentier blushed at my pertinent question. Would to God that I had given him notice on the very day that he came, she said. But it was a sore temptation. They were paying a pound a day each. Fourteen pounds a week, and this is the slack season. I am a widow, and my boy in the Navy has cost me much. I grudge to lose the money. I asked it for the best. This last was too much, however, and I gave him notice to leave on account of it. That was the reason of his going. Well, my heart grew light when I saw him drive away. My son is on leave just now, but I did not tell him anything of all this, for his temper is violent, and he is passionately fond of his sister. When I closed the door behind them, a load seemed to be lifted from my mind. Alas, in less than an hour, there was a ring at the bell, and I learned that Mr. Drebler had returned. He was much excited, and evidently the worse for drink. He forced his way into the room where I was sitting with my daughter, and made some incoherent remark about having missed his train. He then turned to Alice, and before my very face, proposed to her that she should fly with him. You are of age, he said, and there is no law to stop you. I have money enough. And to spare, never mind the old girl here, but come along with me now straight away. You shall live like a princess. Poor Alice was so frightened that she shrunk away from him, but he caught her by the wrist and endeavored to draw her towards the door. I screamed, and at that moment my son Arthur came into the room. What happened then, I do not know. I heard oaths and the confused sound of a scuffle. I was too terrified to raise my head. When I did look up, I saw Arthur standing in the doorway laughing with a stick in his hand. I don't think that fine fellow will trouble us again, he said. I will just go after him and see what he does with himself. With those words, he took his hat and started off down the street. The next morning, we heard of Mr. Drebber's mysterious death. This statement came from Mrs. Charpentier's lips, with many gasps and pauses. At times, she spoke so low that I could hardly catch the words. I made shorthand notes of all she said, however, so that there should be no possibility of a mistake. It's quite exciting. Oh, said Sherlock Holmes with a yawn. What happened next? When Mrs. Charpentier paused, the detective continued, I saw that the whole case hung upon one point. Fixing her with my eye in a way which I always found effective with women, I asked her at what hour her son returned. I do not know, she answered. Not know? No, he has a latch key, and he let himself in. After you went to bed? Yes. When did you go to bed? About eleven. So your son was gone at least two hours? Yes. Possibly five, four or five? Yes. What was he doing during that time? I do not know, she answered, turning white to her very lips. Lips! Ba -ba 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 -ba. Of course, after that, there was nothing more to be done. I found out where Lieutenant Charpentier was, took two officers with me, and arrested him. When I touched him on the shoulder and warned him to come quietly with us, he answered us as bold as brass. I suppose you are arresting me for being concerned in the death of that scoundrel Drebber, he said. We had said nothing to him about it, so that his alluding to it had a more suspicious effect. Very, said Holmes. He still carried the heavy stick which his mother described him as having with him when he followed Drebber. It was a stout oak cudgel. What is your theory, then? Well, my theory is that he followed Drebber as far as the Brixton Road. 
when there a fresh altercation arose between them, in the course of which Drebber received a blow from the stick in the pit of the stomach, perhaps, which killed him without leaving any mark. The night was so wet that no one was about, so Charpentier dragged the body of his victim into the empty house. As to the candle and the blood and the writing on the wall and the ring, they may all be so many tricks to throw the police onto the wrong scent. Well done, said Holmes in an encouraging voice. Really, Gregson, you are getting along. We shall make something of you yet. I flatter myself that I have managed it rather neatly, the detective answered proudly. The young man volunteered a statement in which he said that after following Drebber some time, the latter perceived him and took a cab in order to get away from him. On his way home, he met an old shipmate and took a long walk with him. But being asked where this old shipmate lived, he was un unable to give any satisfactory reply. I think the whole case fits together uncommonly well. What amuses me is to think of Lestrade, who had started off upon the wrong scent. I am afraid he won't make much of it. Why, by Jove, he is the very man himself. It was indeed Lestrade, who had ascended the stairs while we were talking, and who now entered the room. The assurance and jauntiness which generally marked his demeanor and dress, however, wanting. His face was disturbed and troubled, while his clothes were disarranged and untidy. He had evidently come with the intention of consulting with Sherlock Holmes, for on perceiving his colleague he appeared to be embarrassed and put out. He stood in the center of the room, fumbling nervously with his hat and uncertain what to do. Uh, this is a most extraordinary case, he said. A most incomprehensible affair. Ah, you find it so, Mr. Lestrade, said Gregson triumphantly. I thought you would come to m that conclusion. Have you managed to find the secretary, Mr. Joseph Stangerson? The secretary, Mr. Joseph Stangerson, said Lestrade gra gravely was murdered at Holiday's private hotel about six o'clock this morning. <gasps> the turntables! My God, man. It seems, perhaps, that Gregson uh, might not be on the right track as he thought he was. Apparently, Watson was right about judging this dude by his face, though. Dreb Drebber was an asshole. I don't know that he deserved to die, but, like, it seems like the brother possibly beating him with a stick is appropriate enough. Because he straight up tried to freaking kidnap Alice. And that's not cool. My controversial take of the day, kidnapping? Not cool. I'm trying to sit up straight here so I can breathe properly, because that's a thing. Because all parts of your body are technically connected, so I hear, according to science or whatever. So, you know, just trying to... Eh. Eh. There. And thankfully, earlier, my water did not spill on my desk. Because I don't keep it on my desk. It just spilled all over the floor. Where I do keep things. So, but no, it's fine. It didn't actually get anything. Alright. This is probably going to be the last chapter we're going to be able to finish today. So, hold on to your butts. Chapter 7. Light in the darkness. The intelligence with which Lestrade greeted us was so momentous and so unexpected that we were all three fairly dumbfounded. Gregson sprang out of his chair and upset the remainder of his whiskey and water. I stared in silence at Sherlock Holmes, whose lips were compressed and his brows drawn over his eyes. Stangerson too, he muttered. The plot thickens. It was quite thick enough before grumbled Lestrade, taking a chair. I seem to have dropped into a sort of council of war. Are you... Are you sure of this piece of intelligence? stammered Gregson. I have just come from his room, said Lestrade. I was the first to discover what had occurred. We have been hearing Gregson's view of the matter, Holmes observed. Would you mind letting us know what, what you have seen and done? I have no objection, 
Lestrade answered, seating himself. I freely confess that I was of the opinion that Stangerson was concerned in the death of Trevor. This fresh development has shown me that I was completely mistaken. Full of the one idea, I set myself to find out what had become of the secretary. They had been seen together at Euston Station about half past eight on the evening of the third. At two in the morning, Drebber had been found dead in the Brixton Road. The question which confronted me was to find out how Stengerson had been employed between 8.30 and the time of the crime, and what had bec become of him afterwards. I telegraphed to Liverpool, giving a description of the man, and warning them to keep a watch upon the American boats. I then sent to work calling upon all the hotels and lodging houses in the vicinity of Euston. You see, I argued that if Drebber and his companion had become separated, the natural cause for the latter would be to put up somewhere in the vicinity for the night, and to hang about the station again the next morning. They would be likely to agree on some meeting place beforehand, remarked Holmes. Yeah, it's good for the desk, less good for the floor, but good for me that my cup didn't break, because it is a glass, a glass cup, so that would have sucked balls. So it proved. I spent the whole of yesterday evening in making inquiries entirely without avail. This morning I began very early, and at eight o'clock I reached Halliday's private hotel in Little George Street. On my inquiry as, as to whether a Mr. Stangerson was living there, they at once answered me in the affirmative. No doubt you are the gentleman whom he was expecting, they said. He's been waiting for a gentleman for two days. Where is he now? I asked. He's upstairs in bed. You wish to be called at nine? I will go up and see him at once, I said. It seemed to me that my sudden appearance might shake his nerves and leave him to say something unguarded. The Boots volunteered to show me the room. It was on the second floor. And there was a small corridor leading up to it. The Boots pointed out the door to me and was about to go downstairs again when I saw something that made me feel sickish in spite of my 20 years experience. From under the door there curled a little red ribbon of blood. Blood. Blood! Which had meandered across the passage and formed a little pool along the skirting at the other side. I gave a cry which brought the boots back. He nearly fainted when he saw it. The door was locked on the inside, but we put our shoulders to it and knocked it in. The window of the room was open, and beside the window, all huddled up, lay the body of a man in his night dress. He was quite dead and had been for some time, for his limbs were rigid and cold. When we turned him over, the boots recognised him at once as being the same gentleman who had engaged the room under the name of Joseph Stangerson. The cause of death was a deep stab in the left side, which must have penetrated the heart. Now comes the strangest part of the affair. What do you suppose was above the murdered man? I felt a creeping of the flesh and a presentiment of coming horror, even before Sherlock Holmes answered. The word Rache, written in letters of blood. He said. That was it, said Lestrade in an awestruck voice, and we were all silent for a while. Ooh. There was something so methodical and so incomprehensible about the deeds of this unknown assassin that it imparted a fresh ghastliness to his crimes. My nerves, which were steady enough on the field of battle, tingled at the thought of it. The man was seen, continued Lestrade, a milk boy, passing on his way to the dairy, happened to walk down the lane, which leads from the mews at the back of the hotel. He noticed that a ladder, which usually lay there, was raised against one of the windows of the second floor, which was wide open. After passing, he looked back and saw a man descend the ladder. He came down so quietly and openly that the boy imagined him to be some carpenter or joiner at work at the hotel. He took no particular notice of him, beyond thinking in his own mind that it was early for him to be at work. He has an impression that the man was tall, had a reddish face, and was dressed in a long brownish coat. He must have stayed in the room some little time after the murder, where he found blood-stained water in the basin where he had washed his hands, and marks on the sheets where he had deliberately wiped his knife. I glanced at Holmes on hearing the description of the murderer, which tallied so exactly with his own. There was, however, no trace of exultation or satisfaction upon his face. Did you find nothing in the room which could furnish a clue to the murderer? He asked. Nothing. Stangerson had Drebber's purse in his pocket, but it seems that this was as usual as he did all the paying. There was eighty-odd pounds in it, but nothing had been taken. Whatever the motives of these extraordinary crimes, robbery is certainly not one of them. There were no papers or memoranda in the murdered man's pocket except a single telegram dated from Cleveland about a month ago, and containing the words, J.H. is in Europe.
There was no name appended to the message. And there was nothing else? Holmes asked. Nothing of any importance. The man's novel, with which he had read himself to sleep, was lying on the bed, and his pipe was on a chair beside him. There was a glass of water on the table, and on the window sill a small chip ointment box containing a couple of pills. Sherlock Holmes sprang from his chair with an exclamation of delight. The last link! he cried exultantly. My case is complete. Oh! Okay. The two detectives stared at him in amazement. I have now in my hands, my companion said Colton, confidently, all the threads which have formed such tangle. There are, of course, details to be filled in, but I am as certain of the main facts from the time that Drebber departed. Excuse me. Goodness. All the threads which have formed such a tangle. There are, of course, details to be filled in, but I am as certain of all the main facts from the time that Drebber parted from Stangerson at station up to the discovery of the body of the latter as if I had seen them with my own eyes. I will give you a proof of my knowledge. Could you lay your hands upon those pills? I have them, said Lestrade, producing a small white box. I took them in the purse and the telegram, intending to have them put in a place of safety at the police station. It was the merest chance my taking these pills, for I am bound to say that I do not attach any importance to them. Give them here, said Holmes. Now, Doctor, turning to me, are, the, are those ordinary pills? They certainly were not. They were of a pearly grey colour, small, round, and almost transparent against the light. From their lightness and transparency, I should imagine that they are soluble in water, I remarked. Precisely so, answered Holmes. Now, would you mind going down and fetching that poor little devil of a terrier, which has been bad so long, and which the landlady wanted you to put out of its pain yesterday? Oh, no! I went downstairs and carried the dog upstairs in my arms. Its labor breathing and glazing eye showed that it was not far from its end. Indeed, the snow-white muzzle proclaimed that it had already exceeded the usual term of canine existence. I placed it upon a cushion on the rug. I will now cut one of these pills in two, said Holmes, and drawing his penknife, he suited the action to the word. One half we return into the box for future purposes. The other half I will place in this wine glass, in which is a teaspoonful of water. You perceive that our friend the doctor is right, and that it readily dissolves. This may be very interesting, said Lestrade, in the injured tone of one who suspects that he is being laughed at. I cannot see, however, what it has to do with the death of Mr. Joseph Stangerson. Patience, my friend, patience. You'll find in time that it has everything to do with it. I shall now add a little milk to make the mixture palatable, and on presenting it to the dog, you will find that he laps it up readily enough. As he spoke, he turned the contents of the wine glass into a saucer and placed it in front of the terrier, who speedily licked it dry. Sherlock Holmes's e earnest demeanor had so far convinced us that we all sat in silence, watching the animal intently and expecting some startling effect. None such appeared, however. The dog continued to lie stretched upon the cushion, breathing in a laboured way, but apparently neither the better nor the worse for its draught. Holmes had taken out his watch, and as minute followed minute without result, an expression of the utmost chagrin and disappointment appeared upon his features. He gnawed his lip, drummed his fingers upon the table, and showed every other symptom of acute impatience. So great was his emotion that I felt sincerely sorry for him, while the two detectives smiled derisively, by no means displeased at this cheek which he had met. At this check which he had met, excuse me. It can't be a coincidence, he cried, at last springing from his chair and pacing wildly up and down the room. It is impossible that it should be a mere coincidence. The very pills which I suspected in the case of Drebber are actually found in the death of Stangerson. And yet they are inert. What can it mean? Surely my whole chain of reasoning cannot have been false. It is impossible. And yet this wretched dog is none the worse. I have it. I have it. With a perfect shriek of delight, he rushed to the box, cut the other pill in two, dissolved it, added milk, and presented it to the terrier. The unfortunate creature's tongue seemed hardly to have been moistened in it before it gave a long, convulsive shiver in every limb, and lay as rigid and lifeless as if it had been struck by lightning. Ah! <laughs> I knew that's what was going to happen! <laughs> no! 
the puppy. I know the dog was sick. And this is what, I, I mean, hell, oh, Sherlock, you, you're still a dick, though. <laughs> hey, I don't like it. Sherlock Holmes drew a long breath and wiped the perspiration from his forehead. I should have more faith, he said. I ought to know by this time that when a fact appears to be opposed by a long train of deduction, it invariably proves to be capable of bearing some other interpretation. Of the two pills in that box, one was of the most deadly poison, and the other was entirely harmless. I ought to have known that before, I, before ever I saw the box at all. This last statement appeared to me to be so startling that I could hardly believe that he was in his sober senses. There was the dead dog, however, to prove that his co conjecture had been correct... It seemed to me that the mists in my own mind were gradually clearing away, and I began to have a dim, vague perception of the truth. All this seems strange to you, continued Holmes, because you failed at the beginning of the inquiry to grasp the importance of the single real clue which was presented to you. I had the good fortune to seize upon that, and everything which has occurred since then has served to inform my original supposition, and, indeed, was the logical sequence of it. Hence things which have perplexed you and made the case more obscure have served to enlighten me and strengthen my conclusions. It is a mistake to confound strangeness with mystery. The most commonplace crime is often the most mysterious, because it presents no new or special features from which deductions may be drawn. This murder would have been infinitely more difficult to unravel had the body of the victim been found simply found lying in the roadway without any of those autres and sensational accompaniments which have rendered it remarkable. These strange details, far from making the case more difficult, have really had the effect of making it less so. Mr. Gregson, who had listened to this address with considerable impatience, could contain himself no longer. Look here, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, he said. We are all ready to acknowledge that you are a smart man and that you have your own methods of working. We want something more than mere theory and preaching now, though. It is a case of taking the man. I have made my case out, and it seems I am wrong. Young Charpentier could not have engaged in this second affair. The Strad went after this man, Stangerson, and it appears that he was wrong too. We've thrown out hints here and there, and seem to know more than we do, but the time has come when we feel that we can that we have a right to ask straight how much you do know of the business. Can you name the man who did it? I cannot help feeling that Grayson is right, sir, remarked Lestrade. We have both tried and we have both failed. You have remarked more than once since I have been in the room that you had all the evidence which you require. Surely you will not withhold it any longer. Any delay in arresting the assassin, I observed, might give him time to perpetuate some fresh atrocity. Thus pressed by us all, Holmes showed no signs of irresolution. He continued to walk up and down the room with his head sunk to his chest and his brows drawn down, as was his habit when lost in thought. There will be no more murders, he said at last, stopping abruptly and facing us. You put that consideration out of the question. You have asked me if I know the name of the assassin. I do. The mere knowledge of his name is a small thing, however, compared to the, with the power of laying our hands upon him. This I expect very shortly to do. I have good hopes of managing it through my own arrangements, but it is a thing which needs delicate handling. We have a shrewd and desperate man to deal with, who is supported, as I have had occasion to prove, by another who is as clever as himself. As long as this man has no idea that anyone can have a clue that there is some chance of securing him. But, if he had the slightest suspicion, he would change his name and vanish in an instant among the four million inhabitants of this great city. Without meaning to hurt either of your feelings, I am bound to say that I consider these men to be more than a match for the official force. And that is why I have not asked for your assistance. If I fail, I shall, of course, incur all the blame due to this omission, but that I am prepared for. At present, I am ready to promise that the instant that I can communicate with you without endangering my own combinations, I shall do so. Gregson and Lestrade seem to be far from satisfied by this assurance, or by the depreciating allusion to the detective police. The former had flushed to the roots of his flaxen hair, while the other's beady eyes glistened with curiosity and resentment. Neither of them had time to speak, however, before there was a tap at the door, and the young spokesman of the street boys, young Wiggins, introduced his insignificant and unsavory person. Please, sir, he said, touching his forelock. I have the cab downstairs. Good boy, said Holmes blandly. Why don't you introduce this pattern at Scotland Yard, he continued. 
taking a pair of steel handcuffs from a drawer. See how beautifully the spring works. They fasten in an instant. The old pattern is good enough, remarked the Strahd. If we can only find the man to put them on. Very good, very good, said Holmes, smiling. The cabman may as well help me with my boxes. Just asked him to step up, Wiggins. I was surprised to find my companion speaking as though he were about to set out on a journey, since he had not said anything to me about it. There was a small portmanteau in the room, and this he pulled out and began to strap. He was visually engaged at it when the cabman entered the room. Just give me a help with his buckle, cabman, he said, kneeling over his task and never turning his head. The fellow came forward with a somewhat sullen, defiant air and put down his hands to assist. At that, that instant, there was a sharp click, the jangling of metal, and Sherlock Holmes sprang to his feet again. Gentlemen, he cried with flashing eyes, let me introduce you to Mr. Jefferson Hope, the murderer of Enoch Drever and of Joseph Stangerson. The whole thing occurred in a moment so quickly that I had no time to realize it. I have a vivid recollection of that instant, and of Holmes's triumphant expression in the ring of his voice, of the cabman's dazed, savage face as he glared at the glittering handcuffs, which had appeared as if by magic upon his wrists. For a second or two, we might have been a group of statues. Then, with an inarticulate roar of fury, the prisoner wrenched himself from, free from Holmes's grasp and hurled himself through the window. Woodwork and glass gave way before him, but before he got quite through, Gregson, Lestrade, and Holmes sprang upon him like so many staghounds. He was dragged back into the room and then commenced a terrific conflict. So powerful and so fierce was he that the four of us were shaken off again and again. He appeared to have the convulsive strength of a man in an epileptic fit. His face and hands were terribly mangled by his passage through the glass, but loss of blood had no effect in diminishing his resistance. It was not until Lestrade su succeeded in getting his hand inside his neckcloth and half strangling him that we made him realize that his, str his struggles were of no avail, and even then we felt no security until we had pinioned his feet as well as his hands. That done, we rose to our feet, breathless and panting. We have his cab, said Sherlock Holmes. It will serve to take him to Scotland Yard. And now, gentlemen, he continued with a pleasant smile, we have reached the end of our little mystery. You are very welcome to put any questions that you like to me now, and there is no danger that I will refuse to answer them. <laughs> oh! Sherlock! You risky bastard! <laughs> Going about putting everyone in danger! It was the cabman! The cabman! Brilliant. That's the end of part one of A Study in Scarlet. I believe we will commence part two next story time sa Saturday, because that seems like a good natural place to stop for today. To me. And considering I'm the one doing the stream and the story time, my opinion is the one that matters. <laughs> As always, I want to thank you guys for stopping by. Because I appreciate you. Yeah, I think that was a, per a pretty perfect, solid ending, too. I think it worked out pretty well. As always, I must remind you to consume. I'm feeling like, I'm feeling like consumption for today might just be consuming some air. You know, taking some big, deep breaths. It's a relatively nice day where I'm at. So it's got some good air out there to breathe, to consume. Nice. As always, thank you so much for stopping by. Kiss, kiss. Bye-bye. Mm, Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.